Hey, good morning. Good morning. We know you're all uh, trying to get out of your heavy coats, bundled up. But it is 9 a.m. Welcome to the uh, 2024 Joint Appropriations Hearings from the House and the Senate. You know we have a full day. There's also a lot of things that are going on outside the building. And uh, we pray for our first responders and those you know, DOT crews who are working to keep us safe. Um, there have already been a few members who've let us know that they um, could not attend for one reason or another. Some of it due to sickness, some due to um, other issues that are going on. So we'll keep them in our thoughts and prayers as well. We have a full day. You've got the schedule ahead of you. Uh, we want to get started really quickly. And I've asked uh, Senator Strickland if he doesn't mind leading us in the invocation. Strickland, if you don't mind, 28. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you all please bow with me. God, thank you so much for this day that you gave us, Lord. Thank you so much for the ability and the opportunity to serve you and to serve the people of the state. Please be with all of our first responders, all of our state DOT workers and local workers around the state that are serving our citizens as we deal with the weather. Please keep everyone safe, Lord. And Lord, please give us wisdom and help us to make the right decisions in this room for all the Georgians. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Just a brief overview. You've had your budget books now for a few days and been able to see uh, what has been proposed by the governor, who we'll hear from here in a few minutes. We appreciate him making time uh, in his busy schedule, even from overseas, to join with us. Uh, I want to tell you, though, Chairman Hatcher and I have had a time to talk, too. We, we really do need your help this year. We need you to calm through things in your subcommittee reports as carefully as possible. There are a lot of needs around our state, but you'll also see that uh, revenues, as you'll hear from Dr. Bushman later on, are not as strong as they have been over the past few years. You'll see where even in the next month, revenues are not as strong this month as they were the month before. And you'll see where he may predict that we have at least a, a slight chance of a recession uh, in the first half or the second half of this year. So we need your help as we comb through the needs of the state, as we comb through um, things that we've looked at as uh, legislative bodies over the past few years. There are, there's a lot of good items in this budget, but we need to make sure we're being prudent with state money and with taxpayer money. Remember, we're not creating anything ourselves. Uh, all we do is reallocate funds that we create, uh, collect from others. So I think I'd speak a little bit for Chairman Hatchett as we've been talking. This might be the hardest one we've, we've looked at yet. Would you agree, Chairman Hatchett? I'll agree because everybody in here keeps asking for funds. <laughs> so that being said, please do keep your, uh, please do help us dare, uh, dig down deep on these issues over the next couple of weeks and uh, as we work to prepare a budget that's suitable for all Georgians. Chairman Hatchett. Thank you, Chairman Tillery. Good morning. All right, y'all been kind of rowdy already this morning, so I hope that means y'all are getting ready to ask a ton of questions and um, some great questions. Just a, a little bit of uh, housekeeping. So we do have very, very full schedules today, and if you've looked at your calendar, even more so tomorrow. So I know we sit in here and we get questions and and. I'm going to ask that you, um, if it's a question that you can ask offline to the presenter um, because of timing, and, and y'all will know if we're behind, you can read, you can read or watch just as easy as I can. Um, but we've got to give these agency heads time to, to present their story. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, we, I hope we do have some good questions. We'll have some good banter as we had during during our special session with those that presented then. But I, I'm excited really for the first time in a long time that our agencies were able to ask for funds to meet their growing needs for our growing state. I'm glad that we're able to use some of the one-time surplus funds for some of our strategic long-term investments like ERS, DOT, and infrastructure needs all across our state. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing from our governor 
and the agencies about all these additions that they've asked for and looking forward to putting our stamp on the budget and appropriating these funds across all corners of our great state. And with no further delay, I believe our governor is waiting on us as we speak. So if y'all would like to tune in to Governor Kemp, I hope technology works today. There's Governor Kemp. Hello. Hey, Chairman. Can well, y'all hear me all right? We can hear you, and you can't see it, but the room is packed. Everybody's waiting to hear from you. Yeah, I can actually see the room right now, and I see that it is, and I, I hope I'm centered on my screen. I've had uh, our new historic first female chief of staff, Lauren Curry's had this thing working all morning from here in Switzerland to make sure that we could get connected with y'all. So I'm, I'm glad that it's working. It's working and your floor is yours, Mr. Governor. Well, I, I appreciate uh, Chairman Tillery, Chairman Hatchett, uh, appreciate Senator Strickland's prayer. I appreciate the members of the Pro Appropriations Committee and uh, for being able to join you this morning from Switzerland where Marty and I are really sharing Georgia's success story and our business friendly environment with the world and to advocate for the principles that we're so proud of in the great state of Georgia. Uh, I know a lot of the media is probably following the meeting this morning. And if the two chairmen will just indulge me, I wanted to just give a quick weather report. I've been in communications with uh, Director Stallings at GEMA and Commissioner McMurray at DOT. Uh, we pre-treated roads north I-20 uh, all, all day yesterday and last night. We've had a little bit of accumulation in northwest Georgia, but they're dealing with that up there. We're continuing to monitor the very cold temperatures and especially the wind chills that are blowing into the state as we speak and will later today. Uh, I know we've had some school closures out of abundance of caution and some potentially some state agencies that may have had a little delay opening to, depending on where they were in the state. And I just want to urge all Georgians to continue to be uh, winter weather ready uh, over the next, really next week. It's going to be very cold um, and, and just some really treacherous conditions. And GEMA is going to continue to keep us updated. So I'd urge Georgians and uh, everyone out there to, to be ready, but also just to follow the updates in their local media. Um, with that, we're as I said, just honored to be here um, across the big pond, if you will, to let the world know about Georgia's economic success, why we've been ranked the number one state in the country for which to do business. Uh, we had some great meetings uh, here yesterday, and I know Commissioner Wilson will be joining you uh, like I, I am today, and i will speak a little bit to some of the companies that we had the opportunity to meet with, and we've got a, a lot more to do here on our trip. I just uh, want to thank the members of the Pro Appropriations Committee and the members of the General Assembly with your help during my time in office. We've helped attract 100, 171,000 new jobs and roughly, roughly uh, $74.5 billion of investment to our great state. And I'm pleased to say that the amended 24 and fiscal year 25 budgets uh, will help us further these historic economic development efforts in the years to come. As you all know, across Georgians, uh, millions of hardworking families are dealing with the disastrous consequences of Bidenomics, and the federal government thinks the solution is to take more money out of the pockets of the taxpayers. But thankfully, here in Georgia, with your support, we're giving those dollars back to the people where it belongs. And I just want to thank you again for your support of these measures uh, that we've taken really over the last year or so and uh, just want to uh, offer our willingness to continue that partnership to find other ways to provide Georgians relief. As you know, over the last two years, we've returned nearly $5 billion to Georgia families through tax refunds, multiple suspensions of the state gas tax, and direct property tax relief. The budgets you see before you will go even further in helping our fellow Georgians fight through the failed policies of Washington, D.C. It uh, re reflects the historic tax cut legislation that we all worked on together to provide permanent tax relief for our citizens. 
As you all know, originally that uh, legislation called for an additional 26 basis point reduction as the first step in permanently reducing our state income tax rate. As I announced back in December, long time, uh, alongside Lieutenant Governor Jones and Speaker Burns, uh, both chairman of the Joint Committee and other leaders in the General Assembly, I'm proposing that we accelerate that tax reduction by an additional 10 basis points, lowering our income tax rate from 5.75% to 5.39% this year. Uh, this 36 point basis or 36 basis point reduction will save taxpayers nearly $1 billion every year beginning this month. And while this is a great first step, I want you all to connote, know that I remain fully committed to implementing this landmark tax reduction during the rest of my administration, giving families billions of dollars back in their pockets to invest directly into our economy. We're able to do this at a time when other states find themselves in financial trouble because we have focused on growing our economy, not the government. We're certainly not like California, which right now is proposing raising taxes to fill a $68 billion budget hole. Because we chose the smart, fiscally conservative path, we're returning money to people while meeting all of, their, all of our liabilities, and we need to stay on that path or else we risk going the way of these failed blue states. As companies worldwide flock to Georgia to expand their operations, we're making sure communities across the state are able to wel welcome these growth opportunities, particularly in rural Georgia. One aspect of our state we make sure to highlight during our meetings with potential investors here is Georgia's unique position as the home of the most utilized and efficient airport in the world, the fastest sea growth, uh, seaport in the country, and also our ability to move freight and goods to and from our ports across the country and across the globe, which in my opinion is unmatched. But as you all know, and as uh, Chairman Hatchett stated earlier, as our state continues to grow, we got to maintain a safe, efficient, and reliable transportation infrastructure network that will keep these goods flowing freely in and out throughout our state. That's why the amended 24 budget includes $1.5 billion of investment in Georgia's Department of Transportation to maintain our roadways and accelerate construction on shovel-ready projects in every corner of the state. I'd like to note that $641 million of those funds will go specifically to projects that improve our freight corridor. Another $200 million will go to the local maintenance and improvement grants to help our local communities keep their own transportation networks ready to handle the business that, that we are sending their way. And while we have many transportation projects across the state that are shovel-ready, we also want to make sure that our small and rural communities are shovel ready for business as well. This means identifying sites for potential development, infrastructure to support those sites, and the capacity for the workforce needed to support those projects. This budget will help our local government be shovel ready by infusing a quarter of a billion dollars in the Georgia Environmental Finance Authority's Georgia Fund. These funds won't just be available to meet immediate needs. As a revolving fund loan or a revolving loan fund, this will permanently grow our capacity to assist local governments in expand, expanding critical water infrastructure. We're also in investing an additional $56 million into our rural workforce housing fund at the One Georgia Authority for housing site development to ensure families have affordable housing opportunities close to these new businesses and these investment sites. Furthermore, my proposal includes $200 million for economic development grants provided through the REBA and One Georgia programs. $16 million from that investment will be available to provide, local, uh, provide assistance to local governments for economic site development in rural communities. Together, the amended 24 budget will infuse more than $2 billion directly into our state's infrastructure and local communities to make sure we're ready for the unprecedented opportunities that are coming our way. These budgets also invest in our people and ensure that we can continue to reduce the tax burden on Georgia citizens and businesses while still meeting our fiscal obligations. Our status as a triple 
A-rated state is an important economic development tool that lets investors know Georgia is a safe bet. Just as Georgia families must ensure they pay their bills and put money away for a rainy day, we must do the same with their precious tax dollars. That means living within our means and not creating unfunded future liabilities for our children. I believe that in times like these, when our state is on strong financial footing, we should make careful and strategic investments to ensure we're prepared for when times are lean. That's why my amended 24 and fiscal year 25 budgets include more than $1.8 billion for capital construction and maintenance for state facilities. These funds will ensure they're maximizing the practical use of facilities we already have, reduce future costs that can result from deferred maintenance, and meet projected needs in growing parts of our state. And I would like to add that we will make this investment without issuing a single additional dollar in debt, saving taxpayers millions in future debt service costs over the next two, year, two decades. I'm also directing that the savings we realize in our most recent bond sale be reinvested to pay down outstanding debt, further reducing the state's fiscal burden for future generations. We're also putting a record $1 billion in our retirement, risk, and health portfolios to keep those assets on sound financial footing and ensure they're able to grow sustainably to meet future demands. This includes more than a half a billion dollars for our retirement system to ensure we meet our obligations to those who dedicated their careers to public service. And we're putting a quarter billion dollars in our risk insurance pools to hedge against future potential catastrophic claims and settling existing claims. Much like our families and businesses are experiencing substantial increases in the cost of insurance, so is our state. Providing funds to settle existing claims while beginning the process of tackling civil, civil litigation reforms will save our taxpayers millions of dollars in future settlement costs. And finally, we're investing nearly a quarter of a billion dollars in the state health benefit plan through our local K-12 schools. These funds will ensure we're offering quality health care to our teachers without requiring reductions in coverage or further increases on, uh, in out-of-pocket cost. And to help our educators and state workforce fight through the impacts of Biden inflation, I was pleased to announce a supplemental payment of $1,000 for teachers and state employees this past December. And my amended 24 budget includes $306 million to cover that payment. On top of that, my fiscal year 25 budget includes $630 million to provide a 4% cost of living adjustment to state employees and a $2,500 salary in increase for our K through 12 teachers to ensure we remain competitive in this tight labor market. But that is not all. For too long, we have not updated our pupil transportation formula for our local schools. And as our student populations have grown, school systems have absorbed the annual cost to continue to provide transportation to and from schools each day. This means funds that could have gone towards teacher pay and classroom instruction have gone to covering transportation costs instead. Therefore, my fiscal year 2025 budget includes almost $205 million to update the pupil transportation formula and provide significantly more state support for system transportation needs. We're also making smart investments to ensure our students can learn and our teachers can teach in a safe and secure environment every day. With your support, we've already provided $185 million to local schools for school safety needs. I again wanna thank you all for your support of those efforts. My fiscal year 2025 budget includes $104 million to provide ongoing annual funding to build on that success. In total, the fiscal year 25 budget proposal provides our local schools with more than $1.4 billion in additional funding to meet growth needs, improve teacher pay, and maintain health and retirement benefits, as well as securing our schools and ensuring the state is doing its part 
to meet the educational needs each and to each and every student across our state. I appreciate your support and partnership as we have weathered the uncertainty of the last three years. Our fiscal conservative approach has served us well. And as a result, we have the opportunity to make unprecedented investments in our state, while at the same time enacting the largest state tax cut in our history. I wanna thank you for your time this morning, and I look forward to working with each of you over the next few days of the legislative session as we keep Georgia the best place to live, work, and raise a family. Again, Chairman Tillery and Chairman Hatchett, members of the Appropriation Committee, thank you for letting me present this morning. I wish you the best the rest of the week. Look forward to seeing you when we get back. God bless. Thank you, Governor. Thank we, you, Chairman. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. We appreciate all you and First Lady Marty Kemp are doing to always market the great state. Thank you. It's, it's an honor. Y'all have a great day. You too. Thank you. All right. I think we still have a few seats. I think the members that have come in have have gotten a place to sit. I think so. We're packed. Thank y'all. Um, so, we'll move on. You ready? Okay. All right. First up this morning, after the governor, so second up, is our state economist, Dr. Bob Bushman. Dr. Bushman, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, um, thanks for braving the weather to come out, especially if you were uh, north of the metro area and might have seen a little snow. Uh, thank you, Chairman Hatchett and Chairman Tillery, for inviting me to speak today on the economic and revenue outlook for the state. Um, there we go. My presentation today is in two parts. Uh, Focusing first on how we got here, uh, explaining the phenomenal revenue growth uh, the last three years. And second, uh, where we're going. Uh, what is the economic outlook and what does it mean for revenues? First, to recap revenue trends, this graph shows tax revenues by major tax type since fiscal 2018, starting at the base with personal and corporate income taxes, followed by sales, motor fuels, TAVT, alcohol and tobacco, uh, excise taxes and insurance premium taxes and then all other that then blue line at the top. Over five years, state revenues have grown cumulatively by, I have a hard time with that word, I don't know why, uh, by $10.4 billion or about 45%. Uh, but it's important to note that 91% of that growth, about $9.4 billion, came in just two years. Fiscal 2021 and 22. The state's three largest revenue sources, personal and corporate income taxes and uh, sales taxes, in fact, grew by 11.1 billion over the five years. Other taxes performance is varied, and of course, motor fuels taxes uh, tax was suspended for parts of both fiscal 22 and 23. Uh, so, uh, total fiscal 23 tax revenues were essentially flat from fiscal 22. Focusing on the latest full year, we can see that in fiscal 2023, personal income tax was down about $1.3 billion, while corporate income tax was up by roughly the same amount. So what explains this divergence from the two? Large gains in one, really unprecedented gains in one, and a decline in the other in the same amount. A large part of the answer is a structural change in the way pass-through entities, S corporations, partnerships, and LLCs pay taxes. Starting with tax year 2022, these businesses are allowed to file and pay their Georgia income tax at the entity level rather than at the individual owner level. The reason they would do this is the $10,000 limit on state and local tax deductions on their federal tax returns. For the state, it's roughly a wash. What they pay through the corporate income tax would have otherwise been paid through the personal income tax. But they save money on their federal returns, so 30 states now allow entity-level filing for pass-through entities. 
So how much did this loss shift from personal to corporate income taxes? Based on a tabulation by the Department of Revenue of tax year 2022 corporate tax payments, about $950 million were paid in fiscal 23 just from pass-through entities opting for entity-level filing of their 2022 taxes. So there'll be more from their 2023 taxes, a little bit in, in, uh, in the 23 numbers and a lot more in the 2024 numbers. Um, the rest of the story on what's been driving income and other major taxes besides motor fuels is to be found in the economy and in the markets. This graph shows what's been happening to Georgia and U.S. real personal incomes since the last quarter of 2019, indexed to 100 in the first period, so you can see the cumulative growth over time and compare the U.S. to Georgia. The solid lines are total real personal income, including income from employment, from dividends, interest, and rents, and from transfer payments, Georgia in orange and the nation in blue. The dotted lines represent only the wage and salary component of total personal income. The spikes in total income in 2020 and 2021 are the result of the big federal transfer payments during the pandemic. So as those transfer payments wound down, total incomes fell back and ended the period up only about 4%, inflation adjusted over nearly four years. That's not bad, but wage and salary income did much better, nationally up 5.2%, and in Georgia up 8.5%, and continuing to climb through the third quarter of 2023. Historically, wage and salary income has been the main driver of personal income tax revenue, no surprise there. Taxes on wage and salary income are collected generally through withholding payments. And historically, withholding collections have been approximately equal to total income tax collections on average each year each very differently from quarter to quarter, so the lines go up and down. Um, but over the full year, they've been roughly equal. Uh, in fact, um, the dotted lines on this graph that show the 12-month moving average or the four-quarter moving average, they're roughly equal from 2015 through 2019. Um, but they diverge uh, in the last few years. Um, for 2022, the gap between the orange and blue lines represents an extra $3.9 billion of net collections over and above withholding alone, or about two-thirds of the gain in total income tax collections from fiscal 2019 to 2022. So what are these non-withholding payments, and can we count on them continuing? Well, most of these are tax payments related to income earned from a business, from self-employment, or from investments offset by refunds, including those from overwithholding against wage income. I, I read something the other day that said 75% of wage earners uh, are overwithheld and thus get a refund at the end of the year. Uh, I try not to be. I try to make the number as small as possible. I, you know, <laughs> manage my own savings instead of letting the federal government do it. Um, my predecessor talked to you last year about an apparent windfall to the state from taxes on capital gains. But at the time, data weren't yet available to try to quantify how much the state collected on capital gains in fiscal 2022. Those data are now available, and I'll show you what we found on the next slide. But before we leave this one, note that in the last four quarters, calendar 2023, withholding has grown to $15.7 billion, up 34 percent from 2019, before the pandemic. I mentioned before that real wage and salary income in Georgia is up 8.5% since the last quarter of 2019. The rest of the gain is from inflation, or the portion of all raises given by Georgia employers just to keep up with the cost of living. Now let's see how much of the $3.9 billion of non-withholding collections in 2022 are attributable to capital gains. To estimate this, we drew on two data sources, the IRS's statistics of income data for Georgia residents and DOR data compiled from e-filed Georgia tax returns for which capital gains income can be broken out. The IRS data unfortunately stops in 2020. 2021 numbers won't be available until next month. The DOR data 
go through tax year 2021, but only cover e-filers. So some filers are left out, uh, particularly uh, low income, but also more complicated returns that are uh, perhaps more likely to have capital gains. Um, the IRS data then should better approximate total taxable gains in Georgia. So we estimated uh, comparable 2021 numbers, assuming the gains are taxed at the top marginal rate, uh, shown in the shaded area, uh, if you can see that shading, in the last column up there. Um, estimates of the tax revenues, assuming the gain, oh, I just said that. <laughs> Uh, the bottom line here is an estimated $3.2 billion of taxes on capital gains in, from tax year 2021, mostly impacting fiscal 2022. That's $2 billion more than the estimate for 2019 fiscal 2020. $2 billion is 40% of the personal income tax gain from 2020 to 2022 and more than half of the $3.9 billion of non-withholding payments in 2022. Now, we also wondered how best to understand the risk to revenues from the volatility of capital gains taxes. So we broke down the DOR numbers over time by the size of gains reported on each return. The figure here shows reported net gains in several size bins from less than $100,000 per return to over $25 million. What this shows is that the volatility in realized gains comes mostly from the top end, much of which is likely one-time gains, like those from selling a business. In a down cycle, those gains can dry up quickly as a source of revenues for the state. In 2019, for example, when the Fed was last raising interest rates, gains realizations in the largest bin fell by 70% while gains in the smaller bins all increased. We expect to find, once data are available for tax year 2022, a significant decline in capital gains realizations that helps explain the 7.2% decline in personal income tax collections, even as withholding grew by more than 6% in fiscal 23. Now, the income spikes that I showed you in an earlier figure uh, from pandemic assistance payments, as well as the uh, sustained revenue growth of ordinary personal income since 2019 have contributed to state revenue growth in another way through the sales tax. Sustained growth of ordinary personal income, income from a job, a business, or investments and pensions is the main driver of sales tax revenue growth. Nominal personal income growth in Georgia, excluding transfer payments, averaged about 5.5% over the last four years, while sales tax revenues grew by 9.3% from fiscal 2019 to 2023. Now, what explains the faster growth of sales taxes versus income? First, the income spikes from pandemic assistance supported consumption even as income from other sources initially fell for a lot of people. Second, in what should have been a surprise to no one, a large part of those payments were not immediately spent, but rather saved. Now, many of you have probably seen a graph like this before, showing US personal savings rates compared to some normal rate, uh, the orange line across there being the um, 2015 to 2019 average savings rate across the US. The positive gap for about 18 months of the pandemic represents the accumulation of excess savings. The negative gap the last two years is those savings being spent, back, being spent back down. The story is not quite over. Estimates vary as to when remaining, the remaining excess will be spent, but analyses I've seen all suggest sometime this year. The other big factor has been the mix of consumption spending. Beginning with the pandemic, consumption shifted from services to goods. Nationally, goods consumption has risen over 35% in the last four years. Services consumption, on the other hand, is up only 25%. As you know, goods are generally taxable in Georgia, while most services are not. A shift back towards services would mean less sales tax revenue for the state. Uh, 
uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip repeating what I just said, uh, but this, this slide will be in there to summarize the, uh, how we got here part of the presentation. Now let's look at a few other broad measures of current economic conditions and performance over the last year to set up for the 2024-25 outlook. First, unemployment. Going into the pandemic, both Georgia and the nation were enjoying a low unemployment rate of about 3.5%. And as you'll recall, unemployment spiked to double digits by that April, with much of the economy shut down. But Georgia's rate peaked lower and came down faster setting an all-time record low of 2.9% in April and May of 2022. This low unemployment rate has put upward pressure on wages, contributing to real wage growth. The flip side of that is higher costs for employers, pushing businesses to raise prices, which in turn puts pressure on the Fed to tap the brakes. The good news is the Fed's 11 interest rate hikes since March of 2022 have not yet slowed the job market. Unemployment remains at historically low levels of 3.4% in Georgia and 3.7% nationally. Another problem with a tight labor market is that it's hard for businesses to find workers. So we need, to, we need a growing labor force of qualified workers to grow the state economy. This graph shows how that's going. Since February 2020, just before the beginning of the pandemic, Georgia's labor force has grown by 3.1% cumulatively through November. This compares to only 2.3% nationally, not counting the decline in the latest month. Also since February 2020, Georgia non-farm non employment has grown by 5.8% versus 3.1% nationally. The Bureau of Labor Statistics Survey of Households reports a record 5.18 million Georgians employed in November, 243,000 more than before the pandemic and up 98,000 in 11 months of 2023. Growing employment leads to growing output from businesses, which brings us to the broadest measure of economic performance, real GDP or GDP adjusted for inflation. Georgia and U.S. real GDP, shown here indexed to 100 for the fourth quarter of 2019, have grown by 5.6% and 7.3% respectively on a cumulative basis from pre-pandemic highs. Growth has mostly stayed positive since the plunge, uh, even in the face of Fed rate hikes. Georgia outperformed the nation through the end of 2022, but has lagged a bit in the, in, uh, the results we have so far for 2023. Nevertheless, the state economy is headed up strongly again in the latest quarter, up 4.5% annualized in Q3. Now, speaking of the Fed, we've seen 11 rate hikes over 17 months, taking the Fed funds rate from near zero to a target range of five and a quarter to five and a half percent. The Fed has done this to fight inflation which had gotten out of hand because of the extraordinary measures taken by both it and the federal government to boost the economy during the pandemic. This graph shows you the inflation surge that prompted their actions and how their fight is going. Headline inflation, the all items consumer price index shown here in blue, started climbing in early 2021 and peaked at 8.9% in June of 2022, far above the Fed targets. The purple line shows inflation in goods prices. These prices skyrocketed in 2021 and goods inflation peaked at 14.1% in March of 2022. Many of us are old enough to remember that from the late 70s and, and early 80s, uh, similar inflation rates. Um, since then, it's fallen dramatically. Some prices that made the news in 2021, like eggs and meat, have fallen since that, uh, since that time, while overall goods inflation has been near zero in recent months, dipping into negative territory three times since June. So why isn't the Fed done? Why are we still seeing headline inflation of 3.4% for December and core inflation of 3.9%, both still well above the Fed's 2% target? The reason is prices for services. 
which accelerated their rise while goods inflation was easing. Services inflation didn't peak until a year ago and is still high at 5% in December compared to a year earlier. Monetary tightening has had partial success in bringing inflation down, but the Fed is likely to stay tight for a while longer given the latest inflation readings and the lack of other signs of major slowing in the economy. So I wouldn't count on a, a March rate cut, probably a little bit later than that. So what is the outlook for the economy then? Will the Fed stay too tight for too long and cause a recession, or will they engineer a soft landing? What about the labor markets? Can we really fall into a recession with demand for labor so strong and unemployment so low? Well, of course we can. Recessions start from highs, not lows. But a strong labor market certainly helps make for a milder recession, like those in 2001 or 1991, compared to what we experienced from the Great Recession. It also helps that households still have some of the excess savings accumulated during the pandemic. What else is different than the last major recession in 2007 to 2009? Well, consumer financial health for starters. A lot of those pandemic savings were used to pay down debt. So household debt service ratios are far below the levels before the Great Recession. Household debt service payments as a percent of disposable income are about 9.8% as of the third quarter of 2023, compared to 13.3% just before the Great Recession. That's a 26% drop in household debt service, debt burdens. Household debt to GDP is down about the same amount, a 25% drop from 2007 levels. We also aren't in a housing bubble. Yes, prices rose because of high demand and limited inventory during the pandemic, but we don't have easy mortgage money and low rates feeding speculative bubble like we had in 2005 to 2007. Finally, the banking system is far stronger than it was then. A recession now won't start bank runs or crash the financial markets. I hope. Uh, what should we worry then? Well, inflation is still high and the Fed is still tight. An early start to the Fed rate cutting would likely mean they see the economy weakening more than they would like, not that inflation has been whipped. Rising labor costs and difficulty hiring squeeze profits and slow business growth. Higher mortgage rates put, pressure, put downward pressure on prices, discouraging new home construction. And office vacancy rates are at all-time highs. In Metro Atlanta, according to data cited by the AJC a week ago, 32% of office space in Metro Atlanta sits empty because many workers want to keep working from home, and so far, employers are mostly accommodating them, reducing demand for office space. One more thing that I worry about is whether this particular recession indicator the spread between three-month and 10-year Treasury rates will finally be wrong. The last eight times the spread has gone negative, the three-month rate above the 10-year rate on a monthly basis, a recession has followed by between six and 17 months. The only time a recession didn't follow a monthly negative spread was in 1966. This time, the spread first went negative in November of 2022, so we're in the 14th month. Take it as you will, but it's an objective indicator that hasn't been wrong in a very long time. The New York Fed, in fact, publishes a recession probability indicator based on this spread. As of December, the probability of recession by the end of this year is about 63% according to this model. In summary, the economic outlook that went into the budget estimates is this. A mild recession is more likely than not beginning in the first half of this year. The conference board is calling for, that's the publishers of the leading economic indicators index, uh, is calling for real GDP growth of minus 1% in Q1 and minus 0.7% in Q2. Other forecasters are more optimistic, including those at my own school, Georgia State University and UGA, as well as the Wall Street Journal Economic Survey consensus. But 
the headline on the Wall Street Journal's release of their January survey over the weekend was, quote, it won't be a recession, it will just feel like one, end quote. <laughs> the consensus forecast in their survey is now for real GDP growth of just 1% for the full year 2024. Inflation should continue easing, but just fast enough for the Fed to start cutting rates between April and June, according to the, the new Wall Street Journal Economic Survey. Unemployment should rise above 4%, by Q2 uh, and peak later in the year at between 4.2 and 4.3 percent, depending on which survey you listen to. Georgia should do better given our current rate of 3.4 percent versus 3.7 nationally. And of course, we have mitigating factors that, that should make any recession a mild one, uh, and we still may avoid one. All of which bring, brings us to the revenue budget, which is conservative for good reason. The scenario I've outlined suggests pullbacks from the unprecedented revenue growth since 2020. A slowdown in the economy and a modest increase in unemployment along with much lower inflation will be a drag on nominal taxable incomes. While generally more cyclical corporate taxable profits will put corporate income tax revenues at risk in a recession scenario. Goods inflation is behind us, and we can expect a consumption shift back to services, suggesting lower tax revenues from consumption spending, including both motor vehicles and from the general sales tax. We're also halfway into the year and already seeing significant declines in several of the larger revenue sources. Personal and corporate income taxes are both down around 4.5%. Sales taxes are flat, and excise and insurance premium taxes are also down significantly. In sum, we've had phenomenal rev revenue growth in recent years, which makes the comparisons tough, especially with a, slowing, with a slowdown looming. Still, the budget forecast only brings us back to the post-Great Recession trend. And with that, we can open up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Darfin. Any questions from members of the audience? Leader Beverly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a quick question for you. You said that, you know, we have a potential recession or at least a slowdown. It seems like a recession may happen by the end of this year. How do your revenue estimates based on this year or that assumption play into how we should be allocating money? The reason I ask is this. The last several years, the economists prior to you had revenue underestimates, which led to increases which now we have this huge surplus. So how can you ensure that the General Assembly now knows that, look, we're gonna be on track, not because of revenue underestimates, but because you factored in the potential recession that may come in, and then how should we be allocating money in that space? Well, the, the allocation of money is, is y'all's job, <laughs> uh, along with some of my colleagues at OPB and the governor's office. Um, the, the, the question you asked is why I spent so much time in this presentation going over how we got here on revenues to date, uh, and particularly the phenomenal growth in uh, um, 2021 and 2022. Um, I also talked about the, uh, the capital gains contribution to 2023 revenues. And uh, if you look at the capital gains data, um, you can have windfall years, but that, those are usually quickly reversed. Um, in fact, 20, 2022 was a down year for the stock market. We don't have 2022 tax data to show capital gains yet. Um, but we're, like I said, we're expecting those to pull back um, to, uh, you know, more normal levels, nothing like uh, tax year 2021, which hit 22, uh, yeah, 23 revenues, tax year, yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> 21 revenues. Um, the other thing that's in the, the income tax numbers um, are the tax cuts that you all already enacted that took effect uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, as well as the 10 basis point reduction that the governor proposed uh, in, his, in his budget. Um, the corporate income tax numbers show a bigger decline than personal income tax. 
uh, because, in a, like I said, in a recession scenario, corporate, in, corporate profits, taxable profits, uh, can come down a lot. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're being conservative. We're budgeting. We're not trying to be, you know, the most perfect predictor. Uh, we're not Wall Street forecasters uh, where the, the risk of being wrong is the same in either direction. Uh, as, as budgeters, um, you, know, you have to be conservative. So. Representative Evans, is that you? Yeah, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, so um, thank you for your presentation. Hello. Yeah, I'm over here. So um, you talked about that the office vacancy rate was at an all-time high at 32% empty, but, but you said a sign of strength was stronger banks. And I just watched 60 Minutes the other day where they were talking about that some people feel like that might be that I guess the banks hold the loans for these commercial buildings and that that might be a potential big downside to hit our economy. It's like the beginning of some of, of, of a potential crisis. I don't know. I just welcome your feedback on that. I, well, in an earlier life, I was a banker for a little while. Uh, so I, I, I do know how uh, particularly the commercial side works, not so much the, the housing side. Um, frankly, the, the regulatory reforms and the higher capital requirements and all of the excess reserves that banks hold now um, tells me that that any any banking uh, pullback from uh, you know, bad real estate credit or whatever um, it is not going to be a crisis. The banks are unbelievably strong now. Their capital levels are really at levels we haven't seen uh, in, in my lifetime, at least. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not worried about a banking crisis. No. Yeah. Representative Bruce, do you have a question? Uh, does the, the unemployment numbers that you were talking about, do they factor in the number of people that have just given up looking for work? Um, well, the, the unemployment numbers uh, count people who are actively seeking work as right. unemployed. Right. They, right. they don't count people who are not seeking work. I haven't looked recently. The, the uh, BLS also publishes uh, that number that includes uh, people who, are, who have just given up looking for work. Um, because no. that, that could be a very large number, and that's why I, I was asking it, because I keep seeing these numbers talking about the low unemployment rate, but I also keep hearing about a bunch of people that just can't find work and and for giving up. So th that number could be a, a significantly different number. But, and also, you mentioned that there are a lot of employers that are having difficulty finding employees. What, yeah. what types of jobs? What category, I guess, of jobs are they having difficulty finding people for? Um, the particular industries, uh, well, you all would probably, from talking to your uh, constituents, uh, businesses in your districts would probably know better than I would. Uh, but, but back to the, the, the question about the unemployment numbers, they're, they're not low because of uh, people giving up looking for work. In fact, the, the labor force, which includes the the labor force has been growing. People have been re-entering the labor force since the, since the pandemic. Um, it, we, we paid people, or the federal government paid people a lot of money not to work and not to look for work during the pandemic. Uh, but that stopped, and, and people are uh, returning to the labor force. The uh, labor force participation rates have been going up. Chairman Perkle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Down front, uh, I also am a reform banker. Uh, <laughs> couldn't be happier uh, in that. Uh, one of the things, so we derive a significant portion of uh, state revenue from the individual uh, income tax return. Uh, individual uh, income tax payments to the Department of Revenue is a, is a big thing, and you spent a rather significant portion of your your talk here today talking about 
uh, that and how that could impact us going forward. And if I wrote it down right, and I, I could absolutely have missed it, if I, if I missed it, I apologize. Um, so the total personal income is, is basically uh, debt service, which you said is down uh, as a percentage um, of, of, our, of our total personal income. Mm -hmm. Um, essential goods and services, the stuff that we buy that we need. Uh, it's somewhat flat for goods, it's somewhat inflated for services. Plus um, personal savings, which is down. Uh, and and that's, that's including disposable income, et cetera. How concerned are you when we look at the financial status of the state of Georgia? Uh, one of the things that we say is in terms of our health is that we have a, a, a pretty good savings account. You know, in times of, of hard times that we have something to fall back on. It's the same kind of flows for personals. Um, how concerned are you that that continues to fall? Uh, the, I'm sorry, what? The, if I wrote it down right, the personal savings rate. Oh, oh, uh, oh, oh Which oh, is, yeah. you know, yeah. for... You know, in our personal budgeting, my wife and I might call it mad money. You know, this is, this is money that we have that we can spend that I have available. Uh, and that seems to be continually to decline. Um, how big a factor is that in your forecast going forward that my personal savings is diminished? Well, it's not so much that, that personal savings balances are diminishing, but rather the savings rate. So the graph I showed you was the savings rate each quarter, the percentage of, of uh, total personal income that is, that is not spent in the current quarter, just disposable personal income, so after taxes. Um, so falling below the orange line on that graph. Uh, I, that concerned it, me a good bit. That's an, you know, you can draw that line at a lot of different places, uh, I think. Jeff Dorfman drew it at 8% last year. I, I drew it at the 2015 to 2019 average of 6%. Uh, in 2019 alone, it was at 7.4%. Um, so, uh, you know, how low we are relative to normal uh, is, you know, is, is uncertain, but the savings rates did drop below where they've been for, for uh, five years mm -hmm. before the pandemic. Um, but that doesn't mean that balances of, it means balances of savings, of excess savings are being drawn back down. So you accumulate a lot of savings and then you feel flush. You've paid off all your credit cards. Uh, you've paid down some of your other debts. Uh, now you're gonna spend money. Mad money. Yeah, yeah. And so the savings rate statistically drops below normal for a while. Um, it, it's getting back to normal. Uh, is, is what hits the sales tax revenues. So mm -hmm. people cut back their spending when those excess savings run out. Uh, and like I said, um, estimates vary, but uh, sometime this year we expect those excess savings to run out. Okay, thank you. Chairman Hickman. Oh, you don't, Chairman Hickman. Yes, sir, uh, to kind of go back, I think uh, to answer my gentleman to the left, a question in the book that we got um, at the age issues earlier this week from the Chamber of Commerce on the unemployment actually said that in Georgia, I think the average right now across the state for the people that are available work compared to the ones that are working are only 59%. And if you look at the by county, I, I remember one county in particular, only 27% of the people in that county that could work were working. So I think you go back and look at that, I think that'll help us understand a little bit more about the unemployment situation too. Uh, I, I will be happy to take a closer look at, at county level data, but I frankly haven't uh, recently. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised to see, to hear that it's, that it's that low in some counties. Uh, I will, we'll look into it. Given out Monday or Tuesday, I, excuse me. I'm sorry? Uh, it was a red book that was given at the eggs and issues uh, breakfast of the morning. Rep Representative Hughley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm on the opposite side of the room. There we go. <laughs> um, can you uh, tell us what you're seeing that makes you confident that re accelerating the reduction in the income tax rate is a good idea? Uh, well, I mean, the, the, the 
budgeter's job is to balance the budget. Uh, we've, we've had huge surpluses. We don't expect those surpluses to continue. Uh, but uh, some, uh, and the unprecedented revenue growth justifies both some of the spending increases that the governor has requested, uh, well, frankly, all of them, uh, and income tax cuts, giving some back to the taxpayers. Where you all draw that line, how much you give back to taxpayers versus how much you increase spending is, is a, a political choice. Uh, so, um, I mean, that's, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's. <laughs> Chairman Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for, for that uh, explanation as well. Um, I, I have noticing in the amended FY24, there's an additional $2.3 in spending. And then when I look in the book at the lines of, it says $35 billion coming in, $37 billion going out. So that's right. some of the spending you're talking about, that right. three years of conservative budgeting has allowed us now to, to actually begin spending some of that at a safe time when things are not uh, overly hot. You did mention, however, a, um, I think it was 63% prob possibility of a recession. How do we make sure we keep enough money set aside in case unemployment claims go up or if, if national inflation begins to affect right. Georgia more? Um, how, how, do we, how do you advise the right balance between how much of that conservative budgeting that's allowed us to have the ability to be generous now, how do we make sure that we aren't so generous now that we uh, aren't prepared for a massive increase in unemployment claims if the 63% comes true? Well, if, if, um, if the 63% comes true and the recession is more severe than, than we anticipated, uh, that's what rainy day funds are for. Um, we've got a very strong uh, revenue shortfall reserve. Uh, it, it, it's overfunded. Um, versus the you know statutory limit of 15 percent uh so uh, and you know the governor's budget does call like you said for drawing those reserves down uh by two billion dollars to support uh additional spending um but how we you know protect the budget going forward is to maintain those reserves at at a reasonably high level that's also how we maintain triple a bond rating well thank you Senator O'Rock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your extensive comments and data that you brought us today. Um, at what point do we, or do you all have an estimate of what what it would do, how what it would it do to state revenues if we were to expand Medicaid and get all those federal dollars into our uh, state economy? You know, investing in our healthcare infrastructure and uh, hopefully saving rural hospitals from closures and improving our health statistics. Have, is there, is, is the number been, have numbers been run on that at any point? Or uh, I, I focus on the revenue side, not the expenditure side, but my understanding is there are some proposals related to Medicare in the budget. Um, but, that's, but that's an expenditure side question that uh, the um, uh, probably DCH when they're here, or the division director for uh, for that area uh, would know better than I would. I'm sorry. Well, just 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 to clarify, uh, uh, aren't those revenues when we get federal dollars transferred down to our economy that is that uh, yeah a, a, the, a, a knowable thing of, of what, what that would do for the economy? They're not in the revenue numbers that I that I forecast. They're not tax or fee revenues. Uh, they're not own source revenues for the state. They're, tra they're payments from the federal government. So I, I, I can't really tell you much about, it, about them. It's, it's sort of in a different column then, if you will. Different part of OPB. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, close it out as we see the board now. Representative Maynard, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, you mentioned in your um, presentation that personal debt is decreasing and what are all of the different factors that are considered when you're talking about personal debt 
And the second piece to that question is, there are payday loans. Um, is that included in personal debt? And there are these new online um, platforms where people are taking out loans to buy simple things like tissue. Um, is that included in the calculations of personal debt? You, do you mean the buy now, pay later options on some websites? Yes. Um, those, I don't know if the Fed is able to track those yet. That's, that's a fairly new, of course, some of us also probably remember layaway plans <laughs> uh, in uh, department stores when we were kids. But um, that's a fairly new phenomenon. I'm not sure if the Fed is able to track that very well yet. But uh, loans, like payday loans, should be in those numbers. The, the two numbers I cited were, were uh, uh, figures tracked by the Federal Reserve. Um, the debt, debt service payments, so principal and interest payments on household debt as a percent of disposable income, and the total amount of household debt relative to GDP. So the total amount of debt in an absolute sense is not declining, but, but it's shrinking relative to incomes and, uh, and to GDP. Um, so you may you know, see some categories of debt that, that are actually increasing, student loan debt over recent years, for example. Uh, but relative to our incomes and to GDP, uh, debt service burdens and, and the amount of debt outstanding at ho for households has been declining. Uh, and especially uh, since the pandemic, like I said before, uh, trillions of dollars were sent out to everyday people in the economy during the pandemic. And a lot of that money went to pay down credit card debt and other debts. Paying down debts is saving. You can borrow again to spend later if you want, but uh, it is saving. Last question is Representative Buckner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you mentioned that there was a I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. There you are. <laughs> 35 percent increase in goods consumption and a 25 percent increase in services. My question is, and it's just a curiosity, because is that real increase in consumption, or is it an increase in our revenue from things like the, the new sales tax on internet goods? Um, oh, uh, no, it's an increase in consumption spending, but that includes the effect of inflation. Uh, well, I, I think that graph might have been uh, real personal consumption expenditures, but the, what happened was during the, the pandemic, we were all, you know, for a while we were all staying at home and then working at home for a long right. time and going on Amazon and buying things. Uh, those are tangible goods that are all taxable. So. Uh, Capturing more of the online taxes contributed to the sales tax growth uh, during the pandemic. Um, but that shift to goods is counter to a 50 plus year trend where services have grown to be a larger and larger share of uh, consumption spending by households. Um, part of the, the, the increase in, in consumption spending, in taxable consumption spending, was goods and goods inflation. Um, but if that 50 year, we should return to that 50 year trend of higher uh, consumption of services uh, and lower consumption of, um, of goods, and, and that will hit sales tax revenues. All righty. Um, last comment. Uh, Mr. B sorry. Uh, I almost called you Dr. Dorfman. I apologize, Dr. Bushman. <laughs> Good to see you, and thank you again for being here. Can you go back a couple of slides to your slide? I think it started with a Fred at the top. It said uh, it was about inflation. Back the, the inflation more. one, or it's the inflation one. Yeah, it's from the that one yeah. right there. The one thing I want to point out, make sure I'm reading this correctly. I do see that spike in 2022 January between about July 2022 in goods. But looking over at the far left column, that's a year-over-year -year change. So when we go back to zero, that 8% increase stayed on that price of goods, correct? It did. Until yeah. it went negative. Yeah. yeah. Uh, inflation overall has not turned negative. We haven't had deflation. Right. Uh, that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't very often happen. It's usually bad news. It happened in the Great Recession. We had deflation. 
And that's what I want to highlight for our members is uh, even though you're hearing inflation has calmed, please know that prices are going to hold at that higher level as we look at this budget and what's baked in. It's going to get difficult over the next few weeks. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Thank you. Dr. Bushman. So I've gotten a couple of texts. You're, we're, we're, I have allowed people that are not members of the committee to ask questions because nobody else was asking a question. So uh, that if they're the last person blinking, then we'll let them ask a question if we have time. Um, and all the presentations today are online. They're under the House uh, Budget Office, and they're there, and they will be there. So um, just for your information. Our next presenter is Superintendent Woods. I don't know, he's not in the room yet. Is he in the hall? Mr. Doorkeeper, do you see the state school superintendent in halls? Representative Jackson, if you see the state school superintendent out, would you ask him to step on in? Thank you so much. Let's get started. Ooh, hey. All right, if y'all can find a seat, please. Good morning, Superintendent Woods. Morning. How are Welcome. you doing, sir? This, this is you. a rough crew, so I hope you're ready. <laughs> we are always ready. It's a pleasure to be with you today. and. Uh, just really enjoying this South Georgia weather outside, so uh, we'll get right to it. But uh, we're, it's a pleasure to be with you and just kind of present a, an overview of our uh, educational budget and again uh, what was presented uh, by the governor uh, just a few days ago. Um, as we look at uh, you know education over the past really six years, as we look at uh, the budget over the past six years, we are, you know, I as an educator, and I, and I think I can speak for, for all of our districts and educators throughout the state, just want to express uh, my gratitude to both the governor and to you as members of the General Assembly for supporting public education, uh, especially when you look at uh, what has been done in the area of uh, our, you know, salaries for our teachers, uh, roughly $7,000, uh, you know, uh, over that period. Uh, dedicated funding in various uh, grants for school safety. Again, we cannot uh, 
uh, be more excited about the proposal this year uh, in that area, but also targeting transportation, school uh, counselors, nutrition, mental health, and the things uh, that really help make education move in a very fluid and uh, secure way. So again, I do want to express my thanks to each of you who have been a part of that process. When we look at the upcoming uh, budget that has been proposed uh, by Governor Kemp, uh, again, very pro-public education, very pro-child, I would say, uh, really to start off with, with that. Uh, recognizing the work and the leadership of our educators throughout the state, uh, you know, funding of literacy, which again, I know that, that all of you here, you know, have a, a, a great desire to see uh, would continue movement at, you know, forward throughout the state in that area. Again, looking at, uh, you know, uh, in the Governor Kemp's budget, a tiered, you know, statewide literacy coaching model. We were prepared uh, to move forward with that in a very aggressive manner. Uh, $205 million for, uh, you know, school transportation. You know, something that has been needed over the years. Uh, there's definitely been some buff, you know, some deficits with that, but looking at trying to make some corrections with, uh, transportation, you know, based on uh, really some dated uh, QBE funding formula, and $104 million for school safety. I think for myself, when you look at school safety, and as I've shared with my staff, uh, that's where it starts. That before we start talking about ABCs and 123s, we have to be talking about protecting each and every individual that steps on a campus. And again, whether that's uh, physical safety, you know, uh, nutritional safety, mental health or wellness safety, these are all vital parts of making sure that a child is actually ready to learn. As we look at uh, budgeting as well, again, probably I would say definitely not one of the mo more sexier parts of education. You know, we talk about funding and looking at the request there. Uh, funding, you know, is one of the things we look at. I think uh, so in December, you know, uh, we were over here for, for a bit and just talking about, uh, uh, or a question that was proposed, you know, talking about, uh, uh, you know, assessment and again, accountability. And it is uh, really the way we look at uh, our uh, budget. But also when we look at the budget, you know, trying to restore some of the cuts that have been made over the, the past several years uh, to make sure that our kids have opportunity for, uh, each 10th grader to take the PSAT and also uh, to take, uh, I think, at least one AP uh, test as well. Uh, and as we continue to move forward, I know we'll be covering more with that. But uh, again, a consideration of, of restoring that funding would be uh, very helpful to our budget. We've done a lot to, to make sure we've been very respectful and uh, not overburdening our systems uh, with testing. Uh, one of the things since taking office, you'll find that we've had the largest reduction of mandated testing in our state's history. Uh, prior to coming on board, uh, we were about to step into something we call the student learning objectives or the SLOWs, in which every single course would have been tested by every single student. So again, trying to make sure that what we are measuring is uh, appropriate. It is what we want to focus on. And again, you know, really, as we begin to think about this, we are talking about literacy, we are talking about numeracy. Those are our two primary uh, focal points uh, within education. And so we we'll look forward to having that discussion. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna turn this over to Russ Grome, our Chief Financial Officer, and go a little bit more in detail with the budget itself. Russ? Thank you, uh, Chairman Tillery, Chairman Hatchett, for the opportunity to speak here today. And uh, I'd also like to echo the superintendent, uh, and we are very thankful for this budget. It is a very pro-education budget. Um, we, are, we know our districts are very thankful as well. Oh, wrong way. There we go. When we were back here in uh, December, I hit these, these slides, these first couple slides, but I want to briefly uh, reiterate them because this is the largest factor in the, uh, one of the largest expenditures for the state, uh, which is QBE. This is our full-time equivalent students, which are our FTE counts that we do. These are obtained using the student counts from our March and October. They record, their records records the actual class that the students are attending in the six segments of the school day. There are 18 different QBE programs. Uh, the, each of these QBE program weighted, are weighted differently, and which in essence means they cost differently. 
This next slide shows the uh, QB FTEs from FY18 to amended fiscal year 2024. This is a very important slide because as you can see in 2021, we lost about 36,000 FTEs due to COVID. Uh, 2022, uh, we had about a third of those students come back and in 2023, another third came back. However, in 2024, we actually had a relatively flat um, uh, growth with about 785 FTE increase. Our next slide shows the FTE changes from our initial FY24 to the amended fiscal year 24. As I said on the previous slide, the 785 uh, FTE growth was relatively small. However, as you'll see later in the amended 24 budget and the FY25 budget, there is some enrollment growth. And a lot of that focus around when you look at some of these percentage changes, while we did see decreases in our kindergarten, our middle school and high school, there were increases in some of our more expensive categories such as EIP, special ed, gifted, and ESOL. All right, let's talk about our FY24 amended budget. Uh, overall, the uh, QB uh, midterm adjustment for growth was about $124 million. Uh, this was about $40 million based on hold harmless, and then another $80 million was based on the uh, higher costing FTEs. Uh, we had about eight new charter schools um, along with growth. This, this is where you'll see the increase in the state charter school supplement of about $33 million. Uh, as you know, the state charter school supplement provides grant funds to state charters to fill in their lack of tax collecting ability. With each new state charter school, funds are added for this purpose. Next up on this slide, you'll notice the $9 million, which is our special needs scholarship. Um, this is a formula based on actual expenditures, so our first two quarter payments have gone out and we uh, estimated and a shortage of about $9 million, so we're very thankful that the governor put this money back in or enhance this funds, therefore we can uh, fulfill this obligation. All right, as you'll see in the budget document for the FY24 amended, sprinkled out throughout the programs, you'll see uh, various thousand dollar supplements for um, state employees, thousand uh, dollar uh, retention supplements. Uh, that they're in all the programs, but in the QBE program, you'll notice a, a big number of $190 million. This is $1,000 for every full-time benefit eligible employee. Um, this is determined by, we determined this funding amount by the number of earned positions in our QBE earnings formula. Uh, it included custodians, bus drivers, nutrition employees, nurses. It also provided for formula uh, earned positions for CTAE, RESA, uh, GNETs and preschool with disabilities programs. Now, since when the governor made this announcement, uh, some of the uh, districts had already run their payroll and were some were home for the holidays. So we did ask that all eligible staff receive their supplements by 131, 2024. Okay. All right, now the FY25 budget. In our FY25 budget, you'll see a $2,500 pay raise. This is effective September 1st, 2024. Uh, this is about $367 million, and this does increase our base teacher salary from $41,092 to $43,592 in FY2025. Uh, you'll see the enrollment growth, uh, which is about $256 million. This is uh, primarily the FTE growth that we noted earlier on the FTE slides. Um, you're going to see health insurance rate an increase of to uh, seven. $1,760 per member per month, which was a cost about $242 million. Uh, we had a teacher retirement system increase of 19.98% to 20.78%. This was about $67 million. Uh, the cha state charter school supplement, an increase of about $50 million, which was also related to those eight new charter schools. And our equalization formula increased about $267 million. Now, based on the digest, our FY25 equalization is, is calculated to be a little bit over a billion dollars. Uh, with our equalization, this calculates relative system need and the amount of the state match. Uh, wealth is depicted in a, by a local digest. The need is illustrated by dividing the digest by the FTEs. We then equalize school systems with low-level, low 
local per FTE earnings to the state average. All right, some other program changes um, you'll note through our budget is the 4% uh, COLA for state employees with a $3,000 $3, cap. This is about $2 million. Uh, we had supplements for custodians um, of $1,000. We got our sparsity grant, new school nutrition formula increase, preschool disabilities, school nurses, state schools, and our CTAE programs, all to reflect the $2,500 pay raise or 4.1% increase. Also in our FY25 budget are some of our literacy supports. You'll notice a, a million and a half for dyslexia screeners. Um, if, if you'll note, uh, I believe it was in 23, we got a, a, about three and a half million, so this puts it about a little over $5 million for dyslexia screening um, pursuant to Senate Bill 48, which was in the 2019 session. Uh, we also got universal reading screener, uh, $5 million. For the, from the 2023 se uh, session, Senate Bill 538. And we also got funding for tiered literacy coaching of about $6.3 million. This tiered literacy coaching is regional structured literacy coaches and stipends for literacy coordinators based in the science of reading. I have this next slide in here to, um, to note basically that we believe Georgia can follow a similar path to the significant literacy gains, but it's, it's essential that its work includes a tiered and targeted statewide coaching model. In a joint op-ed by Superintendent Woods and former Superintendent Dr. Wright, Carrie Wright of Mississippi, uh, Dr. Wright stated that Georgia can increase literacy progress by investing in tiered statewide coaching model. This next slide, we wanted to note kind of some of where we're at with the literacy uh, professional learning in Georgia Academy. Uh, the Early Literacy Act, which is in Senate Bill 538. Um, this bill ensures instructional materials, professional learning, and teacher preparation and programs will be aligned to the science of reading. The Georgia Literacy Academy launched this fall by the Georgia Department of Education and the Rawlings Center will provide virtual literacy professional learning for K-5 teachers and leaders statewide. I'd also like to note within the first month of opening uh, this academy, we had over 2,700 teachers enroll. This next slide, as I was saying earlier with the Georgia Literacy Act, this kind of shows where we're at to date. Uh, the Georgia Department of Education uh, to date has met all the requirements and is on track to meet all the statutory requirements within the, the act. Um, as you can see, the high quality instructional materials has been completed, universal screeners has been completed, uh, the universal screeners approved by the state board has been completed, and the universal screeners published list has been completed, and we're on track for the free universal screeners and administrative screeners, which is slated to be done by August 1st, 2024. Also in our budget is pupil transportation, as the superintendent noted. noted. This is an increase uh, to reflect updated bus counts and operational costs. This is a $205 million increase to our budget. Uh, some of the operational costs that can be funded with this are drug testing, bus insurance, driver benefits, operations. This brings the total trans pupil transportation funding to approximately $353 million. I wanted to note some of the um, it, um, current challenges that we meet with the with transportation funding, which is why this 205 million is, is so important to our districts. Uh, one of the uh, challenges is increased driver needs. For example, System A has been funded for about 18 drivers since the early 2000. Due to growth, the system in 2023 has about 48 drivers. The funding has, has not matched the growth in our districts. Also fluctuating and changing prices that have had a significant impact on our districts. For example, diesel jumped at 1.33% in just five weeks. Uh, large and immediate price increases for steel, rhubar, uh, tubing, et cetera, have all increased. So this additional 25, FY25 funding will allow the state's increase in transportation support to be from approximately 15% to about 40% of what districts are spending. 
Next up is our, we're very thankful for the uh, FY25 budget to add the school security grants. It's a new program within the Department of Education budget. Um, this establishes $104 million. Um, these amounts to, amount to approximately 45,000 per school. Um, one of the things, significant things with this funding is that is line item funding, which will allow schools to better plan and stabilize security measures. The current challenges with the funding, I believe is an amended fiscal year 23, districts receive some funding. And this previous uh, school grant was greatly appreciated and filled needs such as alert systems, access controls, window film, security cameras, and safety lighting, uh, security related training costs, stop the bleed kits. This one time funding of allowable expenditures to security solutions with immediate or short term payoffs. Ineligible purchases included critical items like vehicles and personal services costs. This new funding, the FY25 proposed school security funding, will allow for line item funding in the annual budget, which will support sustainable and long-term security needs. In addition, schools will have the same purchasing allowability as the previous security grants, but be able to incorporate needed security me measures, such as recurring costs, like salaries for school source resource officers. This next slide just has some additional FY25 concerns, which I'll be talking to uh, both the House and Senate uh, budget offices in the near future. Um, our PSAT and our AP exams, uh, based on prior years, we had uh, utilized some ESSER funding to cover some shortages in these programs, but that funding ha has its run out. We are looking at about a $280,000 deficit in PSAT and about a $521,000 deficit in our AP classes, and we'll need those funds in order to support the obligations. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Woods and, and main man, um, Chairman Hickman. Yeah, thank you, sir. I, I'd just more or less like to make some statements. I, I'd like to use a statement that the governor used this earlier last week, said uh, there is no next year on this literacy, as y'all well know. We, we're behind and, and y'all doing a great job helping us catch up, but you know, my concern, uh, Superintendent Woods is not the top one third, it's the middle one third and the bottom one third that we're really concentrating on. And I think that's what, if we go back to 2013, our literacy rates were higher in 2013 than they were in 2019. And then of course we had the pandemic. So that's why there's such a big, big focus on this. And I appreciate it. But a couple of things I'd like to mention to you is about the screeners. I know the screeners, are, we, 538 requires them three times a year, K through three to be tested and all. I think y'all have identified about 15 or 16 different possible screeners to use. I don't think that we can really measure different parts of Georgia with that many different screeners. I know that the deal center looked at these screeners and I think they maybe narrowed it down to about five screeners to use and I, I would appreciate it if y'all would look a little bit further into that. The second thing I'd like to mention is about the literacy coaches. I think that is a huge impact for all, all of us, all of our school districts in Georgia. And I know in the um, article I saw up there a few minutes ago, when you and Dr. Wright, you mentioned there's about 300 literacy coaches in Georgia. I did a poll over, over the weekend of my first district, RESA, and out of 18 school districts, 14 of them responded back to my poll, and only one of those schools, act, districts actually had a literacy coach. So I need, my personal thing, I, I need to know where those other 299 coaches are in Georgia because they're not in my district, they're not in my area. So I think that we need to look further at the universal screeners and we need to be pay more attention to the uh, coaches. And what I'm going to suggest also is that sometime in the next week or so, I'd like for y'all to come to a joint committee meeting with, with uh, Senator Dixon and myself and, and, and kind of do a more detailed overall as to where we are in 538. Okay. Thank you. We'll be glad to. Yes, sir. Chairman Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I might ask two questions, if that's okay. Uh, I'm very interested um, in understanding um, if our local school systems are performing to the standards that we expect. Uh, the first question I've got, uh, for example, under your watch, third grade reading scores have been stagnant uh, for the past 12 years, depending on what measurement you use. 
the majority of our students are not reading at grade level and the focus on literacy only started uh, with action from the General Assembly last year. Just want to know why. Uh, and then the second question is the single score CCRPE measurement uh, that you changed to four different scores recently. Um, I think that makes it harder for us to understand how our schools are doing. I uh, just would like for you to update this committee um, to the changes to this and uh, how you provide oversight on the lower performing schools. Okay, uh, well, I, I, I guess, uh, uh, Senator, I would say that uh, since day one, stepping on board, uh, literacy has been something I've been very uh, intentional about. Uh, one of the things we looked at, as I shared across the board, is that when I came on, we had adopted something called Common Core Standards. That was something that I knew was, it was just bad. It was bad legislation, it was bad standards, it did not achieve what we wanted to. And that has been an ongoing nine-year process in which I've had to, I guess, battle to get the current standards that we, that we have right now. Uh, our current standards, I'm proud to say, you know, is based on science of reading, which again, previous standards were not. Uh, also, it has a foundational piece, a, K, a K-5 foundational piece, which our previous standards did not. And that was something, again, I objected to, but until I was actually able to have uh, votes in which we could uh, move forward my proposal with the Board of Education, that is what Georgia had. So, uh, you know, I think that's one of the things we have to understand. This is what we expect our students to learn. And it was also, I think I would even say this is on math. So when I'm talking about school improvement and student improvement, it is just not with, with literacy. I think math is extremely important. And probably I would say that as I came on board, math is what I heard across the state. There was a lot of concern about that and we you know, addressed those concerns. And so you know, I feel that uh, we are where we need to be. We have a metric that you know, using the Lexile, which I think is very fair. Um, when you look at uh, some of the things that perhaps are saying are our, our, our students where they need to be, you know, I, I think everyone would agree, no, we, we are not where we are, need to be, but I do believe we have the processes in place. I think we had the, the team in place now, uh, because uh, to be honest, we, what I inherited was not something that was conducive to move, move forward. When you look at the CCRPI, or College and Career Readiness Index, you know, one of the things we look at that, that I think that in the past has always been just a blanket one, one rating. But uh, what I've instructed the staff to do is look and see if we can do better. Uh, we always can say, consider the CCRPI as our uh, uh, report card. Well, any report card I've seen, you know, definitely has multiple measures that I can look at. It's very clear, very clean. And the new uh, CCRPI model that we're looking at is actually more transparent than what we have had. This design is to make sure that our districts can, A, look at the information and make appropriate changes to a, a child's uh, performance and improve as we continue to move forward. So. Uh, you know, I think that as we look at that, this has been kind of an ongoing issue, but uh, I can assure you, uh, you know, things are in place now that I feel very confident about uh, where we are as a state. Uh, the changes that have made, the standards, uh, you know, once again, are something that I'm very pleased with, uh, and we're able to move forward both in literacy and in numeracy as well. Thank you, Superintendent Woods. Uh, could you send me or send this committee a list of the 25 per percent, the lowest percent of uh, schools, the performing schools? Sure. Thank yeah, you we, very much. We've had a list come out, so we'll be able to provide that for you. Thank you. All right, y'all. There's like 15 lights blinking lit up. We're not going to get everybody. So, Chairman Petrie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Superintendent, my understanding is our teachers are the highest paid in this, uh, on average in the southeastern United States. Can you speak to that, the uh, accuracy of that, and where we stand in relation to the, the southeast? Uh, I, again, with the, the, I know within the past, uh, and if this budget is, is adopted, uh, that'll be a, close to a $10,000 increase, uh, you know, since the Governor Kemp, pardon? 95, yeah, we're right at 9,500. So, uh, but as far as where do we rank within the, the, the southeast, I would have to, you know, confirm that. So, so I, I don't have that information off the top of my can head. Can y'all do that for us? Sure, we can be glad to. Chairman Watson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Superintendent Woods, thank you for being here. We certainly do uh, appreciate you being here and answering questions. So the, the governor put in a $104 million for a school security grant program. You know, there have been deranged individuals around the nation that have uh, used our schools as soft targets. Uh, how can we be sure as appropriators that this goes to the schools and are used for what I think are important, the, the school resource officer uh, salary, I think it's about $45,000. That will be for each school uh, across the state if you break that $104 million down. Yes, sir. And if you use, the, use that money for school resource officers, which I think we should, are they certified or if they are, uh, can you just give me some background information on that? Well, typically, you know, when we have school resource officers, in many cases, unless a school system has uh, its own police force, uh, then they typically work through the local, um, either, I guess, sheriff's department or local police department. So uh, by, by and large, they are certified as far as being, you know, uh, I guess, law enforcement uh, credentialed individuals across the state. Um, prior to this, if I'm not mistaken, Russ, you might get to help me out. I, you know, typically what we have found, we have not had funding uh, to enhance uh, or give us the ability to, to put that into salaries. I know with some of the safety grants in the past, that has been somewhat of a limitation with that. So this will be something, you know, that I'm very pleased with. It is something that our districts can look at. One of the things that, uh, that we have worked with GEMA and Homeland Security is to really credential our schools, to look at you know, identifying schools as far as best practices when it comes to school safety. Uh, so that is something that they, you know, report out and we work with GEMA to receive those reports. We look, make sure that, that drills are being done and performed. So, you know, I think that you can be assured that we are uh, addressing as much as we possibly can uh, to make sure that districts and schools are, are performing and, and, and have a high level of readiness. When you look at, at districts as well, and, and in my experience, especially through in the past, you know, there are some issues where you look at trying to retrofit, retrofit older schools is definitely more problematic. A lot of them definitely have more glass, they have more access and more open access. So again, trying to make sure those areas are secure as possible. Uh, one of the things we have seen is just trying to put some shatterproof film on top of some of this glass and that, you know, definitely is very expensive. So with our districts, it's $45 or $45,000 per school. Again, does allow uh, for uh, the hiring of, of uh, school resource officers where, where, uh, where they may not be present or at least not having a full-time individual, but also I think comprehensively looking at, uh, at uh, districts and schools, uh, you know, what is their level of readiness now? One of the things I find out is just entryways, especially in the front office area. Uh, a lot of retrofitting has gone in to, to create somewhat of a safe barrier. So construction costs may be part of the issue. We are working with our construction team to make sure that any new schools that are being built actually has a level of, of school or safety requirements uh, you know, for construction. So it is ongoing, it is comprehensive. This money will allow districts to, uh, or schools uh, uh, perhaps to potentially fund uh, you know, a, a full-time school resource officer that would remain on site. Instead of in some areas, I know that for some of your schools, they actually are shared throughout uh, various campuses. So, you know, we appreciate the, the governor and again, his support and his, and your continuing support of this effort. Superintendent Woods, I'm beginning to think you're an elected official with the length of your responses. Okay. <laughs> I will try Chairman to be concise. Chairman Houston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Superintendent Woods. I have had the privilege of serving on the advisory uh, board of the Atlanta Speech School, mm -hmm. and I want to commend you for partnering with Rollins School of Learning and Literacy. And it's my understanding y'all had a pilot program with one of the schools in Marietta or De uh, Cobb County. Is that right, Ron? Uh, I believe so. We've done some work with Marietta City and uh, the Rollins Center, so there's been uh, a good collaboration. And I think the results were astonishing. And, and the, the report that I got, not only did they increase in reading, but the, the also what they increased in was the number of children that they had had behavioral problems with, 
went real, so there's a lot more to it than just teaching literacy. And thank you for partnering with the Rollins School. I think yeah. people are going to be amazed at the difference we're going to see. Yeah. We, we are very excited, again, when you looked at the uh, Literacy Academy that we mentioned. Uh, again, we are looking at training all K, K3 teachers. Yeah. But I would say that with the Literacy Academy as well, this is being extended to K-5. Uh, reading doesn't stop at third grade. It continues on. Uh, we hope to be able to extend this uh, even up to th uh, six through eight as well and, uh, and beyond into high school. Uh, so we're very excited about the partnership there. I think with the tiered leadership or the tiered uh, coaching model that uh, we're looking uh, at putting in place in conjunction with working with the Rollins Center, we're going to see some amazing growth uh, you know, for our kids. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Whip Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Superintendent, I, I heard in your presentation that a portion of the, the 205 will be used for benefits for, for bus drivers and for transportation workers. What benefits are, are you just are talking about in there? And has your department, um, have y'all created a matrix or have y'all done a comprehensive study of bus drivers throughout the state uh, to determine um, if we have some, especially down in South Georgia, as far as salaries falling beneath uh, where we can continue to hire bus drivers? Yes, sir. Well, I think if I'm not mistaken, Russ, we, I mean, we, our bus drivers are not on a state scale, so it would vary from uh, local district to district, so that continues to be an issue. I think that since I would say the pandemic, uh, as I have traveled throughout the state, I don't care where I go, the hiring of bus drivers is a major concern throughout. Uh, we lost a lot of uh, individuals, uh, again, just because of age and nutrition, but that is something we hope we can adjust, and one of the recommendations that we did have is maybe trying to look at our non-certified people and trying to give them a base salary scale as well. So. With that answer, what level of control does, do you have over bus driver salaries throughout the state? None, as far as my so, agency. So yes, we're just we're, we're sending money down there and, and trusting the local school districts to, to hire bus drivers that are transporting our children back and forth to school every day. Is that Would that be a, a good enough answer? Yeah, well, they hire, yes. Yeah, or thank you. Russ? Yeah, I was going to say, in addition to the hiring, those funds go towards operational costs. So as, as far as tending training. Uh, yeah, I, oh, I'm sorry. In addition to the salaries, uh, those funds go to operational costs. We're increasing the, uh, the available funds that those school has for op operations. I, I understand the operational yeah. side, and you can have the absolute best buses in the United States of America, but if you don't have well-compensated men and women who care about the children on the bus and they can transport them safely back and forth to school, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what your operational budget is. Thank you. All right, we're going to take two more questions, and then Chairman Tillery has a question. Leader Beverly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is uh, two parts. The first one is on the AP courses that you mentioned earlier. Uh, is an additional 800000 bucks that's going to go to AP courses. Is there a movement to standardize AP courses around the state of Georgia? Because in Gwinnett, they may get certain amounts, and make it may get certain. But is there a, is there a movement to standardize AP courses that kids are getting in, in school? Well, once again, I think looking at the funding, that always continues to be the issue. With, uh, with a large district like Gwinnett, definitely they have more funding, more resources they can put towards the AP uh, because we're looking at QBE and how can we establish a, you know, a, uh, I guess a course. It's not the lack or desire to, but uh, if, if it has to come down to what we are, what our school districts are, uh, I guess, able to put into place because if they do not acquire the QBE funding then that means any AP course would probably have or would have to come through local local funding as you know uh, resources as well I think Russ can you think that you want that's to good that's good enough okay. thanks a lot because I know we're at the time sure. time crunch so okay. I'm gonna go to my second question which is about kids who are in poverty in this in the state of Georgia mm -hmm. one in five kids are in poverty in the state of Georgia and there's no money in the budget that you just presented that suggests that we're going to do additional services for those kids. There's a ton of research out there that says if you just increase 21% per pupil in the money that we find, we could eradicate, we could eliminate the achievement gap that we have in schools. But I hadn't seen that in your presentation that we're not talking about opportunity weights that the state could address right now for those one in five kids who are in poverty. Is that something that you guys are considering to do? 
Yes, sir. I think uh, when we looked at my priorities list this, this, uh, this year that was released, uh, one of the things looking at some type of weighted formula as far as it in regards to poverty. So it is something we are aware of. Uh, currently right now that most of, of the addressment would probably come through our federal funding with Title I schools and supports uh, through our federal programs as well. Representative Ballard. Um, yes, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Superintendent, uh, for coming. I want to add um, and echo Senator Hickman's comments about the screeners. I really do think that we need to limit those to the ones that have been uh, vetted by the Deal Center. But I do have a, a question about teacher salary, and I heard y'all say the base salary for teachers in Georgia, but what's the average teacher salary? Do we have those numbers? Yeah, well, I, I would have to check. Again, depending on, I mean, right now, depending on the years of service, that okay. would kind of skew it, so. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Superintendent. I can answer a few of those questions. I think your average teacher salary now is north, of, depending on which statistic you look at, north of 61, you're the highest in the southeast. Georgia statistics show it's between 65 and 69,000. Um, my questions, though, are related to some of the things we've already touched, and I think I need to defend the, the legislature on one topic. On literacy, we asked you in November, do y'all have a plan to please bring a plan back to us before this joint meeting? It, should I, I haven't seen anything besides this budget, so should I understand that this budget is the department's plan for literacy? It, it is part of the comprehensive plan, yes, sir. Uh, if you'd like, I can definitely forward uh, you uh, more information on that and the plan itself. Yes, sir, I just, I asked for it to be here before this joint hearing today back in November, so I would like that, yes, sir. Sure, I'll be glad to, sir. Uh, the second is on testing. Uh, you made the a comment, I appreciate, uh, Rusk, you're excellent on your, on your numbers about the PSAT and the AP test. As the, literacy, as the legislature has reduced testing funding, we have specifically stayed away from those two areas for the past, since 2020. So I don't understand how we have the gap there unless there's spending that's been on other tests that we were asking to be eliminated based on the fact that you've already told us that we have eliminated, I believe, one third of standardized tests now. So we specifically excluded those in the budget. Yes, sir, and we did not cut them. Um, the PSAT and AP is uh, how many students take the exam. So we've had an increased need. The, the base budget is still the same for PSAT and AP. This adi these additional costs are more kids taking the test. Okay. And so, uh, so highlight this number for you just as I got that. We'll look at those figures more. Yes, but that $7.1 million increase in testing is a, roughly a 33% increase in state funds at the same time while we're reducing the total number of standardized tests. So we may need to dig into that a little bit further. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, we can, we can provide wanted to defend the legislature on the PSAT and the AP line, and items. The last comment is, can you briefly, we've had a lot of comments lately heard from superintendents about the $1,000 raise that the governor um, announced last month. Mm -hmm. There have been some comments from superintendents that the legislature shorted them or the governor shorted them. I, I, don't, I don't think that's fair at all. Can you briefly go over how that shortfall may exist, or if you want to, I will. Well, at, at, at this time, again, I, I have not seen anything as far as there was a shortfall. The, the money was allocated, and again, to our expectation, which I've had, I would say, at least during December, there was one system that wanted to get creative, and I made a very firm stance that, you know, what the intent of the governor was and how the money was to be allocated. Now, I think within some, as Ruck said, uh, the distribution was a little bit problematic is that within some of the districts, they had already perhaps given both uh, a December and a January check as the, the, uh, the uh, staff was out. But, uh, you know, the expectation is what it is. It's very uh, definitive about who is to receive that money. And uh, we are following up on any leads and any uh, discretion uh, which uh, uh, districts are you know, putting forward. But I assure you, we are getting emails and we are following through with the concerns that are out there. The expectation is we are going to do what the governor expects. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Woods. There are quite a few members that did not get to ask questions. If those of you had questions, if you want to meet with Superintendent Woods outside or Superintendent Woods, I will uh, strongly encourage that we're here for the next about three months. It seems like there's a lot of people that have questions and I, I'd love to see you around. 
Okay. We are, we are Thank you. always around, and we will be here if you need. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Chancellor Purdue. Sorry we're already behind, but head this way, sir. All right, y'all, please, let's make this transition quick, please. Also, it's very apparent that the room is full, so if there is a desk besides you, if you would point out to your colleagues that maybe are looking for a seat um, where those are. Are you saying you're going to leave, Representative Williams? Are you saying... Are you calling him an empty suit? That's that's dangerous now. That's dangerous. Okay. All righty. If you don't mind going ahead and uh, please ceasing your conversations, Chancellor Purdue. Thank you for being here. Well, good morning, and Chairman Tillery, Chairman Hatchett, and all you members. Happy New Year. Good morning. Boy, it's good to see y'all. Missed you so much. Uh, Glad to, ha glad to have you back. We're happy and appreciate the opportunity to discuss our budget request for the university system here today. And today I really want to focus on really two issues I think that are important to you all and all Georgians. That's accountability and transparency, essentially equaling value in our university system, including the work we've been doing over the past year to improve in those critical areas that we look ahead for the next year. So. I want to begin by thanking you all, Governor Kemp and others, for the investment that you make and the support you've had for higher education in Georgia and helping us to build a highly skilled workforce. You know, $300 million recommendation for FY25, including operating capital and uh, operating budget, $542 million recommended for the amended FY24. That helps us provide the value to Georgia and to our students and families, supports our goals of affordability, efficiency, and degree attainment. So some questions, uh, some question, and we see these questions nationally, are accountability, value. So uh, here to talk about some facts and have a good conversation with you and answer your questions today. Here is a good, quick reminder about our impact on Georgia employing about 48,000 full-time staff and faculty at 26 public institutions across the state, a statewide economic impact of over $20 billion. Since 2011, what we're really interested in, a 37% increase in degree awards. Uh, that includes more than 75,200 degrees awarded this past fiscal year alone, the most in our history. and. Uh, we stress completing a degree because that's really the ticket. And there's a direct link between education, economic development, and quality of life. Uh, I think like most of you, I'm kind of a facts guy. I like data. And the facts show that USG bachelor's degree holders are going to make over a career about a million dollars more than a high school graduate. That's not everybody, but that's the average, and that's what the facts say over their lifetime. You may remember this slide from last year. We shared it with you as a visual statement of our principles that way. 
The funding this body provides to the university system helps us to provide value to Georgia, to our students, and to our families, and it supports those goals of affordability, efficiency, and degree attainment. Education, as we all know, is life-changing. We literally can change the trajectory of a family, a family tree for the future with a higher education degree. That's the business that we're in, and I'm a firm believer that higher education changes lives. In his address last week, Governor Kemp talked about reaching even more Georgians and helping those who may be on the fence about college or who think it's out of reach. We know about 40% of our high school graduates in Georgia don't go straight to college. For 2021, that included more than 43,700 high school graduates. The launch of the Georgia Match Program, hopefully you're familiar with it, uh, was our effort to reach out to these students and indicate sending them the data. You know, young people understand about money, career earnings, although there's some point to instant gratification, they want that $20 an hour job right now, but over a career, it makes a difference, and that's why we're trying to reach out the largest direct college admissions program in the nation, and it's already making a difference in that way. Through the program, USG alone has received more than 13,000 requests for information, while 17,000 students have cl already claimed their spot, generating more than 10,000 applications and more than 7,000 students admitted through the MATCH program. So we're going to make a difference in those lives. These may have been the students that someone back in their career in middle school maybe that said, you're not college material. This says you can go to college and you can be successful. You can get a degree and change the trajectory of your life. That's the purpose, that's why we're doing, doing that. You know, Governor Kemp talks about Georgia for 10 years in a row. We brag on the fact that we're being the best state in the nation to do business in which in turn makes us the best state to live in and raise your family. Well, we want to make it the best state to get higher education in as well. That's our goal, and you see that uh, good, better, best. That's what we're serious about that. So I call it the virtuous cycle of economic development. I first learned this, I told you last year, from Governor Zell Miller that saw the confluence of economic development and education, the, the talent flow, the skill flow that comes in our state makes a difference higher education, how businesses are looking for graduates, looking for talent flow that provide the best opportunity for Georgia to be successful in the future. So it's about providing that value and focusing on being the best is where we wanna be. We know that state funding is critical in helping us provide an affordable foundation for our students and for growing programs in areas this state needs like education, cutting edge technology, agriculture, nursing, those programs. Accountability is also important too. That's why as, as the public investors in this system, we owe you uh, honest answers, transparent answers, and accountability to you as you represent your constituents, the taxpayers of this state. So I wanna talk about our goals and priorities that center around our accountability, as well as transparency, quality, and affordability. And I hope you'll avail yourself of these tools that we have publicly available now. In a moment, I'm gonna share some examples of how we're making much greater use of data in our decision-making, including metrics and dashboards to help track our progress and see what we're doing well and where we can do better in that regard. We've continued to expand our Georgia Degrees Pay Program. Uh, it's a website to put important details for students and parents about the cost to attend college the value of that degree program, the potential earnings in the workforce right at the fingertips of our students, families, and all Georgians. This is good information. If you had a junior or senior in high school now, you know the anxiety that creates with what their future is going to be and how they make those decisions. This is a helpful tool for them. Since last year, we've increased the amount of data available and continue to work on it even more accessible and more valuable. We've also re revamped how we approach institutional budget hearings. This has been an interesting uh, experience with our presidents, uh, really talking more, less about narrative and more about the money, where it comes from, that you all appropriate, how we expend it, and how can we can be more efficient in the utilization of those funds that you appropriate. So it's a, uh, it's a different kind of budget hearing for our presidents, but they're responding and understanding more about the operational details of their institution 
and how they can impact its efficiency as well. By examining the data, we can see how sources change over time, as well as how funds are being used across both functional areas. Instruction, research, academic student support, plan operations, all those things that are required in a university environment. Natural clarifications, salaries, utilities, supplies, maintenance, those kinds of expenditures. We're also looking at staffing areas, levels across functional areas, and how these levels have changed over time in response to changes in enrollment and efficiency. We're also doing something that makes them a little uncomfortable among the presidents. We're comparing different uh, colleges and universities to see how they match up with their peers and to be available to them so they can see some of their peers doing really well in some areas, then they can, uh, they can find out what they're doing and then they can tell others how they're well they're doing in some of their areas. So why does it matter? Because we want to be good, efficient users of the funds, the taxpayers' funds that you all appropriate to us. We're studying fixed costs and trends in higher education are spending their funds to address priorities and the needs of students. We're going to use this data to build more dashboards and show comparative budgets among our institutions as I indicated. Institutions can then better learn how to operate. Another one operates, and while USG improves our ability to determine best practices in operating as efficiently as possible. Let me just show you some examples, and I know when you look at slides, it's frustrating. I just want to show you an example. You're not going to be able to read all these as we go through quickly, but I just want you to see what the kinds of things that we're doing here. Uh, and if I go too quickly, please call and I, we'd be happy to walk you through this where it's available and how you can see them as well and share more in-depth information. Here's an academic metrics dashboard from Kennesaw State University. This one shows how students have been changing their major earlier, which is a good thing, getting to the best place sooner rather than later. The median hours of uh, number of hours earned before major changes have been dropping, helping better students keep uh, track on graduation and lowering their cost to attend college. We want them to finish sooner, which is better for them and better for the system as well. So this is just one example of some of the metrics dashboards that we have. I'll show some more. But harvesting, harnessing data like this, we're providing tools to institutions so they can see which courses students are struggling in. Then you drill down to analyze those certain courses and those certain professors maybe and subject areas to determine what the issue is, if there's an issue, and where the accountability can lie in that regard. This is amazing what you can learn. Here's the next couple, next couple of slides from our strategic planning process in 2029 for the strategic plan. You can find right on our website the plan which we just reviewed allowed us to continue to focus on student, student success here, economic competitiveness, responsible stewardship, and community impact. That's what we think you hire us for to do is to influence and make Georgia better through those four pillars of higher education. Because when our students succeed, Georgia succeeds. And responsible stewardship, that's value. That's using the money you gave us efficiently. We want to be economically competitive, and then obviously we want to impact our communities where all these 26 institutions are. The first slide shows we're on our goal to increase degree completion. You can see several of these metrics show good progress, and a couple show an opportunity for us to improve. If we don't see those also, we just think we've got a great Chamber of Commerce day out here, but we need to find out where we're falling behind so we can work on those areas and point them out specifically. Retention rates are up. Graduation rates for students pursuing bachelor degrees look, that looks down, but it's actually a 0% change. You'll see the median earnings tab is a lower right-hand corner, says 2018 data, which reflects the latest federal data that's available. So we'll, we'll update when new data is available. This next slide measures our progress of afford, uh, insure, affording, ensuring affordability for students and being as efficient as we can with our resources to optimize efficiency across the state system. 
We've kept tuition, the regents have kept tuition flat for six of the past eight years and have had modest increases to mandatory fees, housing, dining rates, which as you see here, impacts the cost of attendance. We're very cognizant of that. The cost to operate any business, including higher education, you know in your own personal and business budgets, that continues to rise. Need to acknowledge that institutions are facing increased costs due to inflationary pressures. I talked about that last year. We know that intuitively, but uh, we've got the data that shows exactly what's happening. Across our system, utility costs are up over 20% while utilization actually is down. And the uh, food costs are higher. Competition for people puts pressure on salaries and wages. For example, in the fields of IT, accounting, legal, we're competing with top private companies. That's not anything new to you. You all face the same thing as your personal lives. Our housing and dining operations are competing with local retail operations in that way as well. So to counter that impact, as you can see, we've decreased operating expenditures, increased funding, uh, fundraising opportunities, and importantly, as I mentioned earlier, decreased students' time to degree completion. We launched Georgia Degrees Pay last year with the goal of providing a one-stop website to help students and families make decisions on college affordability and value. Along the way, we found a way to provide a lot of data that really allows them to take a deep dive in shopping for college and the payroll they're likely to see from their degrees using real-world results. This first slide compares the cost of attendance, including tuition and fees, as well as net price, including the average amount of scholarships and grants earned by students. This slide shows our time to degree uh, cost uh, calculator, which we've made a public as a public comparison tool. You can use it to see the financial implications of how long it takes to earn a degree for undergraduates, each of the system's 26 public colleges and universities. Finally, this last slide shows the median uh, salary for USG graduates who live and work in Georgia and earn their bachelor degree in computer science. 10 years after graduation, those graduates are making almost uh, average $116,000 a year, helping to make Georgia's economy stronger and growing their family's prosperity and uh, certainly getting social mobility of many of these first generation students out of poverty and changing their whole trajectory of their family going forward. The progress and success that I've shown you with these slides is coming as the Board of Regents continues to emphasize affordability, quality, and value. As one of the top public university systems, we offer the seventh lowest tuition and fees in the country. Thanks to the leadership of our board for many years, they've not raised tuition in six of the last eight years. Thanks to you all, the appropriators of the taxpayers' money, you all have helped us to actually reduce college costs in 2023-22 by eliminating that special mandatory institutional fee, saving students and families anywhere from $340 to over $1,000 annually uh, for their attendance there. We could not have done that without the funding support of Governor Kemp and this body uh, of legislators. So as you can see, among the 16 states that make up the Southern Regional Education Board, the University System of Georgia ranks third lowest in undergraduate tuition and fees. We continue to concentrate on affordability and efficiency, but those priorities do not come at the expense of quality. Georgia is only one of four states <coughs> with at least two public universities, that's Georgia Tech and University of Georgia, ranked in U.S. News and World Report's top 20 public colleges and universities. Georgia College and State University, the designated liberal arts public university here in Georgia, earned its highest rankings in USG among regional universities in the South, number one in business, number one in computer science, number one in nursing, one in psychology, among all the regional public universities in the South. So it's not just our flagships of Georgia and Georgia Tech, We've got others, University of North Georgia on the U.S. News regional list, ranked number one on the best college for veterans, number one for least debt, measure schools with students grant graduated carrying the lightest debt loads. That's important. 
Dalton State College prioritizes access to education, was recently number one in the nation for student experience by the Wall Street Journal and the College Pulse. Fort Valley State University, one of our HBCUs, the number one public historically black college and university in Georgia for the sixth consecutive year, achieved the highest ranking in the state for social mobility among public regional universities. But most of all, we have not lost sight of the fact that students, no matter where in Georgia they come from or what they want to do, are our number one customers. That's why you appropriate the ma uh, money and that's what our mission is. We're grateful to this committee and to the body as a whole of the General Assembly for your investment in the University System of Georgia, and we look forward to working with you again this session and answering any questions that you may have. And now I'd like to go to the budget specifically, to the numbers, and look at the recommendation for amended 24 and 25, if you will allow me. These recommendations for amended Physical 24 can be found on pages 314 to 317 in your budget book. We're summarizing them here, but I want to talk about several of them uh, with you. As you can see here, the budget includes the governor's recommendation of $88 million to support the sourcing of a new enterprise resource management system and to begin implementation. What's an what's a enterprise resource management system? It's a cloud-based system that helps us coordinate. There are over 22 out of 26 different student-based systems, banner systems there that makes it very difficult. We have to do a lot of intensive movement of data between us to get these kind of data reports that we're giving. This would allow us to consolidate that. It's what most modern companies have moved to is a con consolidated enterprise resource system that's needed. The goal is pretty simple, have one simple unified platform for financials, human resources, and student account management for all 26 institutions. That's when you can really use data to move the needle for productivity and quality you know, going forward. The current system that we're using obviously is legacy, developed more than 20 years ago. The technical foundation for these aging systems become obsolete from programming and difficulty in finding people who know the code that was originally written there. Uh, they also allow us to improve the standardization of information across the system and approve reporting and data availability for decision making, which is very much in line with my vision. So this, uh, you'll find these funds on the, and, uh, in that uh, 314 to 317. An additional $80 million to support major repair and re, re, uh, rehabilitation. You know MRR funds are used to invest in the renewal and upkeep of existing facilities, infrastructure at every institution in the system. Uh, again, it allows us to address much of the backlog of capital maintenance and update existing facilities, HVAC, roofs, all those things. You've got a home, you understand those challenges that need to be continually worked on when you have kind of the kind of square footage USG has. 1.2 million, this is important because one of the things we focused on in our institutions is doing away with some of the buildings that are not used, getting that square footage off of the formula and not having to continue fund buildings that we're not using. So you'll see $1.2 million providing funding for two needed uh, demolitions, a vacant building at Valdosta State and at University of West Georgia uh, and that's, uh, that's important as well. We're continuing to look for you. You funded demolitions in the past and we're moving forward with that and uh, we want to continue in that regard. Uh, again, $52 million for one-time pay that you all have already aware of and uh, was actually, uh, we hope you'll approve that because the money's gone. Uh, 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 so, uh, uh, it's uh, That'd be, that'd be hard to get back. Uh, so uh, 14 and a quarter million dollars for the Georgia Research Alliance. And I want to make a personal case for that. Uh, we saw these eminent scholars and the amount of money. We're getting multiple fold return on investment from the things we're putting in the Georgia Research Alliance. These eminent scholars bring millions of dollars to our state and uh, to our universities, as well as the good, goodness of what universities ought to be doing is research. And so this is a great investment. I hope you'll uh, see that well. And we kind of went through a 
a low spot over the last few years, but Georgia Research Alliance is a worthy goal, and I would commend that to you uh, in that regard. Again, $66 million, I think we're all familiar with that, the formula funds, we're very hopeful, and uh, hopeful these funds can be restored. You, we sent you last year a list of what happens with the individual institutions. We try to mitigate that as most, much as possible, but it's frankly, honestly, very difficult to mitigate $66 million in, uh, in that regard. <laughs> Those funds are a vital component of the USG's budgets as state funding reductions over the years. That 10%, you remember, in the pre-COVID money, which was a wise physical move, still had not been restored. So that's, uh, this just added to that, uh, that pressure in that area as our institutions face those rising operational costs that I shared with you earlier. The other in, in here you see is $827 million for Fort Valley State University to support the land grant match requirements. That's a federal required match. As I learned at Secretary of USDA, Georgia is one of the few states that's been very aggressive in matching uh, those federal land grant funds, and we're proud of that, and we want to continue to do that. I know that uh, we don't really talk a lot about reductions, but you can see a $2.6 million uh, give back here, uh, and then a $2.28 million in funding and was included, included in that that was disregarded by the governor. The next slides reflect cash-funded capital projects recommended by the governor in the amended budget. And these projects can be found on page 389 in the book. Uh, receive $50 million toward the design and construction of the medical school at University of Georgia. We've had a partnership there with MCG uh, for about 12 years now. Uh, this is an authorization for the University of Georgia to pursue independent accreditation through the LCME uh, Licensing Board for Medical Education uh, as an independent uh, uh, system uh, medical college there. It, uh, you understand, I think you understand the physician gap we have in Georgia. Uh, it would, UGA would be expected to raise private dollars to support the total cost of a facility. And why is there a need for that? I think we all know. We got physicians here in this body and Georgia ranks dead last in the number of medical students per 100,000 population. That is 41 out of 41 uh, states with public medical schools, and that's not a ranking that we want to lead. It is something that's desperately needed. I'm a big believer that Georgia will be the fifth largest state in the not too distant future, and we're gonna only survive that if we have uh, good medical care. That's just one of those quality of life issues that is needed here, and uh, we, we've got a serious need for that. Uh, I know you all as representatives probably know these numbers better than I do. 89 out of Georgia's 159 counties are designated primary care health professional shortage areas. Nine counties have no doctor at all. 18 counties have no family medicine physician. 40 counties have no internist. 65 counties have no pediatrician. 82 counties have no OBGYN. 80 counties have no general surgeon. And 73 counties have no emergency medical physician. Folks, Georgia can do better than that, and we need to do better than that. So I hope you'll look at that very seriously. $178 million, here's another medical profession, <coughs> to provide funding for the design, construction, and equipment for a dental school. There was a uh, consultant report that recommended this last year, and uh, this will be a expansion of the Dental College of Georgia that we're all proud of under the accreditation of the Augusta University to be located in Savannah at the Georgia Southern University campus there. And I think, again, I could go through all the reasons of why the need for that is as well. But uh, Georgia ranks 46 out of 50 for general and advanced practice dental providers per 100,000 in the United States. Only, listen, this is not a list we want to be on, folks. Only Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, and Delaware rank below us. We can do better than that as well, and we need to. So I hope you will support those kind of medical professions as we go forward. 
$15.89 million for renovation repair at several of our B units, uh, specifically the Marine Institute, Marine Extension, College of Agriculture, Environmental Science, Precision Agriculture. Those are all important to our number one industry in Georgia. And I'll highlight some major items in the FY25 budget. Uh, that your recommendation is on page 318 to 323 for FY25. There are three statewide spread adjustments related to the cost of living adjustment, health care increases, and TRS. These line items are found within all 19 programs considered in the, in the Board of Regents budget, but I'll address these for the agency as a whole rather than by individually by program. $2.2 million for credit hour growth through the funding process. And then the next item is the state support from M&O funds for new academic square footage. The increase of 106,000 square feet generates about 659,000 in state funds. That's essential for plant operations. Uh, you can't build it and they will come. You build it and you got to keep it up in that way. You know that. $23 million to support uh, increases in health care for active employees. Folks, I need to tell you, do you know what the original bill on this was? Increase in health care for our, all of our employees and staff? $77 million. We, our team went to work on it with plan design changes and the increase is down to $23 million. Don't you like that way I say that? Down to $23 million now. So uh, that's, what, that's what it is. $8.3 million to reflect the change in the employer, TRS employer rate. That was no control of us. It went from 19.98% to 20.78%. You're going to see that in other agencies as well, education agencies as well. 97.3 million to support a 4% cost of living adjustment, not to exceed $3,000. I need to point out, this is for all state funded full-time benefit eligible employees and they all appreciate it and we appreciate it on their behalf. But as you know, we've got approximately 15,000 positions that are funded by other sources of revenue to include federal grants, sales and services, those kind of things that are not included. It will give challenges to some of our universities to find the funds to match the state increase in salaries in that regard. In the past and previous years, our institutions will need to determine how best to fund those for employees and other non-state non fund sources. This could impact tuition and student fee levels. So $66 million reflects the permanent restoration of the reduction in formula funds previously discussed. So the total recommendation for FY21 is $197 million. And if you'll allow me, I, next I'll move to the capital budget and try to finish up so you can get to your questions in that regard. The slide will show that the governor's recommendations for capital for FY21 includes $108.8 million in support of capital projects. In this uh, interest of time, I won't discuss these projects individually. I'd be happy to discuss with any of you individually any or all of these projects. And we'll provide additional details on each, each project as we go forward. So, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you all for, again, your time and attention here. Uh, and this concludes our operating and capital budget recommendations. I want to thank Governor Kemp and you all from a committee perspective and all your colleague members uh, in the General Assembly for your continued support of higher education, University System of Georgia. When I talk to my colleagues around the country, they are they're really jealous and envious of the Georgia and the investment that you all continue to make in higher education. And I'm grateful for that as well. Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to answer any questions from the committee. Chancellor, I could say that we won't take questions and we get caught up, but I think all these lights would probably be upset with me if we did that. Uh, Chairman Hickman. Mr. Chairman, thank you for being here. Um, I'd first of all like to thank you and your staff. Um, Y'all allowed me to meet with 21 different colleges, right here. university and presidents uh, in the last two months. And what I learned very much is every one of them is very distinct and every one of them reaches a, a different uh, group of people in a different part of the state. And I was very impressed with that and I, I very much support it. Um, one thing that really stuck out to me in the business world, you know, we're always taught in the business world to, if something is not working, do away with it and find something that is working. And I think that what you have instilled in the college presidents across the state of Georgia is if you've got programs that are not working 
or underutilized. Students are not going to, let's do away with those programs and let's find the programs that, that are actually are good for that part of the state. And I thank you for doing that. Now, my question to you is, last year, uh, L Lieutenant Governor Burr Jones sent you a letter requesting you to identify and report on the DEI mm -hmm. um, stuff that was going on at the various colleges sure. and universities. You did that, a very extensive report, and we appreciate that. Can you give us an update on that now? Yes, sir. Well, those numbers uh, obviously continue to evolve uh, really downward in that regard. The Board of Regents, again, last uh, spring passed policies uh, dealing with that from a uh, diversity of work or thought process, more so than uh, identity politics in that regard. And uh, we're continuing to see uh, campuses evolve in that way. We put it in our human resources as well uh, over those kind of things. Uh, our goal is to be welcoming to all students at every campus in that regard. That's the goal, and our presidents bought into that. They are uh, uh, moving, uh, moving personnel around to integrate them into uh, student activities and the personnel and the human resources and others uh, to make sure that we follow any particular laws going on, but to uh, enable them to be a welcoming, hospitable environment for all of our students and. Uh, as a team uh, going forward. So I'm, I'm very impressed. We've held our presence accountable. I speak to them on a regular basis about the progress they're making here. That's not to say you won't find some particular website or something like that. If you do, let us know. But uh, I think we're making great progress in that regard. Chairman Beach. Chairman, Chancellor, great presentation and thank you for providing us an educated workforce. I've been told that uh, we are lacking in bioscience infrastructure such as wet, uh, wet lab space to compete with Boston and Silicon Valley. My question to you is what, what's our game plan to compete in the bioscience arena? Actually, I think our, our data would support the fact that our, many of our universities are making great efforts in biosciences and uh, anyway, the relationship that you have with Georgia Tech and Emory and the University of Georgia and Georgia Tech as well as Kennesaw and others are providing great opportunities. So that's one of the things Chairman Hickman was talking about, is we look at the demand for different, the economy's changing, degrees are changing, skill sets are changing, bioscience is a growing number. I'd love for Georgia to be at the top of the list over uh, health-related bioscience technology and research in that regard. And uh, we're, the, anytime a program comes up as a recommendation from our campus, those have been approved by the Board of Regents. Chairman Billy Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator, Governor, Secretary, Ch Mr. Chancellor. Yeah. Come um, on, Billy. Come on, I, Billy. <laughs> Come on. I, I, you have a great story to tell, you really do. But, you know, what we do in Georgia, as in some states, we fund colleges based on prior year enrollment. And as a result, uh, I agree with you, attaining a degree, student success should be paramount. Uh, however, some schools don't do as good a job of retaining students. Uh, what in your, your shop are, are the efforts to retain students? And the part B of that, that question is, because of that way we fund schools, there are some schools in Georgia which uh, their enrollment the previous year was down, and therefore they can't be innovative. They, they, in fact, it has the opposite effect. They have to eliminate services and staff. Uh, how does your shop address those issues? Sure. Both of those are good points. The, the good news is I think we've turned, even looking at the enrollment cliff, which is a demographic cliff for high school graduates coming, I think we turned the corner on the post-pandemic COVID response there. We saw our, our most 22 of our 26 institutions had enrollment growth uh, year over year this past fall, and that helps. As you know, there's a two-year lag. That's been the challenge, obviously, the last two years in helping to uh, uh, really putting a lot of pressure on our budgets and our campuses in that regard because of the enrollment decline. But I think, again, some of those are down to the, to the level. As far as helping these colleges with their attention overall, 
We've got a great example right here with Georgia State University with their retention model and the record they had uh, over the last 10 or 15 years in that regard. The Institute of Student Success that they created out of there, Tim Rennick, Dr. Tim Rennick still running that. We are, again, trying to uh, metastasize those pro projects and those uh, uh, aptitudes across our system. They're working with uh, several of our campuses right now over things that lead to student success uh, in that regard and helping our students become more successful. Retention, as you mentioned and you know, is a vital component of enrollment. You, it's just like uh, we don't want them going through the transfer portal. We want them to stay and graduate, you know, that way. So, or, or just leave in that regard. We want, them to, we want them to finish. Retention is a huge part of that. They're fundamental kind of early indicators. What we learned from Georgia State, they're early, early indicators of students falling behind. And if you get mitigated early on, you can recover those. Also, the fact that some of the, some of the issue is financial. And Georgia State did a great job with their Panther grants that way. Sometimes it's just a, a, a few hundred dollars to a thousand dollars that can keep a student in there to finish their degree. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, we're going to close out with that, and I will just have close with with a request. I've sent several quest, requests for some information to your some of your great staff while you've been presenting, but I have a request that I hope you can get with our state health benefit plan administrators and figure out how we can reduce our insurance premiums <laughs> like you're doing yours. So, thank you. Not touching that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right, next up is Commissioner Greg Dozier with Technical College System of Georgia. As senators, I see a lot of you slipping out. After this meeting, I'm going to need to talk with each of you. And if you don't talk to me, please just grab Angela before you slide out the door. Commissioner, you're, you're lucky not everybody left. I mean, you know, that, that's good. You still have a, a good yeah. audience here. All right. It's the only thing between them and lunch. All that's right. Fine. Well, let's, let's get started. Commissioner Dozier, the floor is yours. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. And uh, pleasure to be here and good to see everybody this morning. Uh, we obviously know at TCSG our mission is workforce. So, as you look at this growing a workforce for Georgia is what we're going to talk about. And when you look at our mission, it's very clear. We did a little slight change and I always like to uh, brag on the staff. Uh, we added that we want to recruit and grow a globally competitive workforce. I think in the past we've often looked at when somebody showed up at one of our 22 colleges, it was our job to make sure they had the skill. But our college presidents, and you'll see that in enrollment, and our staff out there have really gone into recruiting, growing enrollment, making sure our workforce pipeline is there. And obviously our vision, we couldn't be uh, more proud as you look at uh, many times the governor talks about the mission of state government is to uh, grow the pros prosperity of our citizens. And I couldn't have been more proud that our vision statement uh, has that in that. It had it in it prior to hearing the governor state that, so that even makes it even more special. But the Technical College System of Georgia will enhance the economic opportunity and prosperity of Georgia's citizens. How do we do that? We obviously do that through skill set. We do that through our five pillars for growing the future pipeline. We do that through technical education, adult education, Economic development, which is also customized training. A lot of times economic development's misheard from our standpoint, but that's where we do customized training for specific industries. 
We do it through our work source and our career services. That's the Wagner Pizer and the WIOA funding that we talk about. And we do it through our quick start program, our five pillars. When you look at that on a map, we have 22 colleges, 88 campuses, 35 career centers, and three quick start training facilities across this state. Breaking that up into how we serve, very, very proud. We touched 550,314 lives last year. When you look at that makeup um, in adult education, we were able to serve 37,000 individuals in economic development. We were able to serve 117 quick start, 62,000. Our technical education, over 136,000 individuals and through WIOA and Employment Services, 196,000 employees, I mean, cu customers. The real exciting story there is the growth. Last year when I met with you, we talked about we were coming out of the pandemic and we were seeing the numbers start coming back to our school system, our college system. Those numbers have become real. You'll hear this year's budget based on the technical education side of things, uh, the funding based on a 3% growth in our funding formula. That's part of the story, but our current fall numbers that I'll show you in a minute tell the rest of the story of how it's growing. But for last year, when you look at this pie chart, adult education grew by 10%. Our customized training or economic development by 21%. Our quick start services by 18%. And our technical education, that credit side of the house, at 3.8%. What do those numbers look like? And we'll spend a lot of the rest of these slides on that specific tech ed because so much of our budget, the state appropriations is tied to the technical education formula funding of our nearly $500 million budget. Over 400 million is specifically tied to the funding formula related to serving students in tech ed. And so when you look at those numbers in tech ed, you see that we had that push up in 2020 right before the pandemic. We shared about the, the drop at the pandemic in 21, 22, and in 23, that's what we're here talking about is those enrollment numbers at 3%, but we're almost 10% growth in fall over fall this year. And our projected number for this coming year, that's why you see that dotted line, it's just projected at this point, is at 144,000. So we truly are out of that pandemic at the end of this fiscal year, next year when we come back before you, we'll be looking at the numbers for the formula as it is with USG. It's a year behind on that funding formula, but we'll be back here talking about numbers that are higher than pre-pandemic. Very, very excited about that. Really a lot of that success goes to our 22 college presidents, our faculty out there, going back to what is our mission is to recruit and grow and make sure that essential training is there. I also have to thank this body and the governor. Last year we had an incredible budget. We appreciate that. We were, we were very, very uh, pleased and you'll see that the monies that this body gave us for high demand areas went toward high demand areas and the results are, ph are phenomenal. We had 35,000 graduates last year, over 60,000 awards, a 76% graduation rate, in our highest ever in-field placement rate of 91%, meaning if someone got something in welding, somebody got something in nursing, that's the actual occupation they went to work for. We also issued 8,149 associate degrees last year. When you look at the uh, credit enrollment, it was up, it was up to 136,114 up 3.8% in headcount. The formula is based on credit hours. Credit hours are right at 3%. So when I get to the budget in a minute, you may go, well, wait a minute, he said 3.8, this is headcount. The actual number of credit hours was 3% up. And that's what we'll talk about on funding. In the high demand areas though, the students are coming in and they're looking for that value certificate, that value career. 8.7% of our increase was in high demand. And for the first time in a long, long time since the Great Recession, we had four consecutive semesters of growth. Specifically, nursing went up 6.7%, CDL went up 24%, automotive 6.3%, manufacturing 3%, cyber 
and our law enforcement academies, 28.8% growth. Very phenomenal. So where are we today? That was your 3% growth for last year that ended. This is our fall over fall. So looking at just partial current year, fall over fall, which is our largest numbers, 9% enrollment growth, 9% in credit hours. Of that growth, 6% is in traditional students, 18% in dual enrollment. And in those numbers, just like last year where we saw 3% growth, but 8% was in high demand, we got 9% growth, but we're seeing 13% growth in the high demand areas. Matching some of those numbers we mentioned earlier, cyber's up 15% in this, manufacturing 13%, law enforcement 13%, nursing 11%, aviation 5%, and CDL another 4%. CDL's a funny one, that won't grow because as we add the students, that number continues to grow. So we're 4% over last year already at this point. So when you look at it year over year, it's an incredible story. And once again, we thank you for your support, both in, uh, in what you do in your communities, but also in the appropriations process. Some of the statewide initiatives, uh, you heard about Georgia Match, the governor launched that. We have high hopes and high expectations, give you a feel for it. So far in the early stages, of Georgia Match, we have gotten over 5,253 uh, future students asking for information. Of that, we've had 3,600 save a spot. Just to remind you, a student can save a spot at three institutions. Uh, it can be one of ours, one of USG's. Uh, so they can save a spot at three of those. And we've seen applications come in for over 800 students. We're early into that, but we're seeing results on the Georgia match and excited where it's gonna lead. A Couple of years ago, this body passed dual achievement. Uh, thank you to former uh, Chairman Lindsay. We've already enrolled that as five pilot high schools across our system. We've already had 76 graduates, folks that were not gonna get a high school diploma that transferred to one of the five pilot high schools we have inside TCSG. We have had 76 graduates and over 625 enrolled in those five pilot high schools. Very excited about it. Micro-credentials, that's gonna connect all of our pathways. I talked about those five pillars to begin with. A micro-credential is a non-credit little certificate. It doesn't count in any of our numbers for formula. It doesn't count in our numbers for awards. It doesn't count in our numbers for graduates. But it gives somebody come to us a sliver of something to put in their profile, LinkedIn, their resume, and they get a, a micro-credential saying they're good at a small part of the welding certificate. So it shows that they have learned a skill, but they haven't finished a program. We have issued over 25,000 of those at this point. It's early on. They'll continue to grow, but that'll connect across whether it's customized training, credit training in our technical edge, adult learners who are looking to further themselves economically and, and have greater prosperity in their career. It'll cut across all five of those pillars and really join us together. Very excited about it. We did something new this year. We did three regional business roundtables. We focused that on based on a lot of uh, comments, but we could have done it in a multitude of areas. We did it in aviation, e-mobility, and nursing. As you know, all of our colleges have advisory boards to make sure that we're teaching what the skill is needed by the industry. But we wanted to have a global approach this summer and we went across this state and we met in those three areas in, in, in three different regions for each area and heard from the industries to make sure we were matching the needs and really had a really good turnout on that. We're continuing to grow articulation. As you already know, we have 18 course Courses articulated with the Department of Education. So somebody's going through CTAE, they get a welding certificate while they're in high school through the CTAE program, they get college credit at TCSG. We had not done this before the pandemic. Those 18 have grown and they'll continue to grow. We continue to make sure that's a seamless pathway between us, K-12 and USG and our privates. As you look at it, we have over 28, as you know, statewide articulation agreements, but we have many, many more local articulation agreements between the USG, our private colleges, and our colleges. Diving real quickly into the budget, Mr. Chairman, we 
very, very blessed this year and thankful for the governor's recommendation. Um, make sure I'm on the right page. I am. The AFY 2024 budget recommendation, which is on the governor's document at three, page 362. As we look at this, I thought we'd go through it through the columns. The first column, you see our base. That just gives you where our current funding is based on last year when we ended the appropriations process. The next column is simply the spread of the one-time $1,000 bonus that the governor uh, gave us and we gave out in December for a total cost of $6.7 million across all of the programs that we have. The third column is our workload adjustments. The first item in there that you'll see in the amended budget is $10.25 million. That's the final cost of the uh, completion of the Rivian training facility. Last year, this body and the governor signed the initial 46 million for design and construction, the 10 million is what was not included in that final number. 4.7 million is to go to our Quick Start program. As you look at Quick Start, we've been very blessed uh, and, and this money will go primarily toward renting of space to train our partners as well as trainers and developers. So as you look at that, some of the ones that we don't talk about that have been huge is SK On, Hanwha, Q cells, all the suppliers that you're hearing there are coming for Hyundai and others. And so as you look at, Riv at Quick Start's budget, this $4.7 million will go toward primarily providing training space, but also the trainers and developers to provide that training. The next item is a removal of $1.1 million. That's one of the items that was deferred in the governor's budget at the end of the year, and that's the uh, tools for success that was put in for this body, and it's been t being taken out of the budget. The next column is workforce expansion initiatives. Very, very excited about the first item. It's 19.5 million. That 19.5 million will be to renovate existing lab space and provide equipment for e-mobility and advanced manufacturing. Those locations are Chat Tech in the Ackworth campus, West Georgia Tech in the LaGrange campus, Central Georgia Tech in the Milledgeville campus. Breaking down that 19.5, it is 6.5 million per facility, 3 million for the renovation, and 3.5 million for the equipment. The next item is startup funds and equipment for what was put in the budget last year and deferred, or, or vetoed, I believe, or deferred. It was the statewide regional health care project at $10,000. It's a quick start light process to actually focus in on health care across this state. You'll see in the big budget in a minute the funding for the two positions. So this is the startup and equipment. In the big budget, we'll talk about the funding for two positions that came from this body last year for a total of $19.5 million. Our budget item in uh, the amended for capital outlay, which is on the next page, is two items, Augusta Technical College, we are, uh, the governor recommended, and we hope to see in the budget, $5.5 million for a 12,500 square foot facility in McDuffie County. Uh, at the McDuffie County facility, we have a transportation, aviation, and supply chain logistics area, but we do not have CDL. So this $5.5 million will actually pay for the pad that we need to provide CDL training at that location, along with some other construction. The next item is one college and career academy at $3 million. And so that will kick off one more last year. Just to remind you, we ended up with just one in the budget. This will add a second one in the amended budget this year. Looking at the big budget, FY25, the first column is our statewide changes. Just rattling those off, it's spread by program, but the COLA is $11.3 million for the 4% COLA, which is capped at $3,000. Just as uh, the chancellor mentioned, just a reminder to this body, and it's always about 47% of our staff are non-state funded positions. So as we look at the 11.3, our colleges will be uh, attempting to, to adjust and fund the 47% that are not included in this 11.3. TRS adjustments, 233,000. DOAS adjustments, 422,000. Georgia Technology Authority, 326,000, and merit system assessments of 151,000. The total amount of statewide adjustments, as you see at the bottom of that second column, is 12.4 million. 
Our workload adjustments, you'll see the first item is the removal of that one-time money for the Rivian training facility at 46 million. You'll see the continuation of the quick start money of 4.7 million that I mentioned in the amended. You'll see the continuation of the removal of the 1.1 million that was in the amended for the tools for success. And then you'll see the final part of the customized recruitment for the Hyundai project of 643,000. Last year, a little over 200,000 was put in based on the commitment of over 800,000. This is a remaining commitment by the state to provide customized recruitment for the Hyundai project. The next column I have mentioned, it is the 3% increase in credit hours based on our formula at 9.4 million. There's two components of that. So the first one is of the 9.4, 8.9 million is related to 53,000 additional credit hours in our formula. And the remaining amount of that is related to a square foot increase that you see there for 444,000. The last column has the first item of $5,000 related to Senate Bill 112. That's the accelerator pilot. That piece of legislation allows for third party providers to uh, train adult learners working on a high school diploma. So that's a piece of legislation this body is taking up and assuming it passes this session, we'll have a $5 million uh, implementation cost. The next item is, is our 3% request. We ask for additional campus police officers. Today, just to give you an idea, we have, to, once again, 22 college campuses, 22 colleges, 88 college campuses. We only have 97 officers. So if you think about that, we have two at system office. We have 22, I'm sorry, 20. Uh, police chiefs, when you subtract the leadership out of it, you only have 63 patrol officers. And so very, very thankful to the governor for adding this $1.8 million to hire 22 new campus police officers. In the budget doc document, you'll see that we are asked to use existing funds to equip these officers. The next item is a transfer to DOL. You'll see this 409,000 come out of our budget and go to the Department of Labor. And the last item on here is 322,000 for the two positions related to that quick start approach to healthcare that we worked with this body last year on. The last page of the presentation today and last item in our, in our budget uh, recommendation by the governor is the capital outlay recommendations. You'll see these in just fixed budget. I didn't mention that earlier, but they're cash funded just as the governor mentioned in his presentation to you today. These items include equipment refresh of 5.4 million, the furniture fixtures and equipment for the Ogeechee's Industrial Robotics Training Center at 3.5 million, a renovation, which is a phase one of Athens Technical College in the Walton campus. It's an old high school there. That's where uh, Piedmont has actually partnered with us to increase our nursing. It's where we also have a lot of CNC but we're also needing to increase that area for advanced manufacturing. This would renovate the field house, the welding lab, industrial systems, replace all the HVAC and many other things at 8.9, I mean 9.8 million. The next item is Southern Crescent Technical College. This is a renovation, it's, it's, uh, it's 2.6 million, but just to follow the budget, there'll be a redirection of 4.5 million that was not used for a project at Southern Crescent for a total project here at 7.1 million. The next item is Wiregrass Technical College. It is a transportation logistics training center. This is a replacement of a 22 year old modular building that's really out the CDL pad. And so we will be getting rid of that old modular facility, building a standalone facility there uh, next to it for 8.9 million. So you can see it's not that big of a facility. Central Georgia Tech is a renovation in the uh, Bibb County area for the trades and industri industry building. That basically is our welding, HVAC, manufacturing, robotics. There's many safety, ADA, and lighting issues for 17.5 million. Georgia Northwestern is a renovation for the industrial technologies facility. It hosts uh, welding, precision manufacturing, advanced manufacturing at 16.9 million. And the final one is Lanier Tech, Building B Advanced Technology Renovation Center. It's also an advanced manufacturing facility, really focused on SK and Kubota at 6.7 million. The one thing I would like to point out is all of these projects you see before you 
are not a three-year phase in as you've seen in the past. A lot of our big projects come in and we want to get the design money. We then ask for the construction money and then we ask for the equipment money. Most of these, all three are in one. Several of them we will have to come back and ask for equipment next year, which is a small item. But none of these uh, have construction costs in the future. So I'm very excited about these costs and for the most part they're primarily one-time expenditures. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my presentation, and if we have time, I'll take some questions. That's oh, very nice of you, Commissioner. <laughs> I, I didn't well, mean it that several, way. <laughs> several other questions, several other questions yes, have come up. We had three for a long time, but I do have one quick one. What's the status of the quick start construction for the Rivian and Hyundai? Facilities. The status of the training facility, the training or they're facilities, at, yeah. yeah. How, where are we so we have uh, on both of those. We have actually identified the design team, and we are uh, through the renderings, but we have not started the actual construction. The Rivian ones um, near on my mind. We should start construction on it in March, and I'll be honest, I'm blank on what the date on Hyundai's is, but they're very similar on that timing. Okay, uh, Chairman Kirkpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for a compelling story that you're telling. Um, you may or may not know that today's Aviation Day at the Capitol. There are a lot of people from the aviation industry roaming around here, and uh, I may have missed this, but we know that aviation and aerospace are evolving industries in Georgia that are big ticket industries, and I just wondered if there's anything new that you guys are working on moving into the future for that. Yeah, we, we have been working very, very hard. I give Chairman Knight a lot of credit for uh, keeping the focus on aviation in his committee, but very, very proud of our aviation program. We do have this body funded a new facility in Paulding County. That facility will be open up uh, fall semester, which will be the largest one that TCSG has. And if memory serves me right, serve over about 300 to 350 students, that's off memory. Uh, but very, very excited about how that's moving in that direction. But we're seeing expansion in all of them. Yes. Chairman Jaspers. There we go. Thank you, Chairman Hatchett. Commissioner Dozier, you know, of course, thank you for all that educators do for us across the state. I just got a question, you know, on, you know, I know we've been having issues hiring qualified teachers especially in our high demand technical positions and um, which just limits course offerings especially yes. from some of the satellite campuses you know what have we done to address uh, this the past year yeah great question and a real problem mr chairman so thank you for asking and that's been a, a one-off basis at each college trying to make sure we manage um, as you as you guys know we have 6,000 full-time staff, but we have another 6,000 adjunct instructors. And so as you adjust one field, the other fields have to stay in balance to some degree, but we've been doing it one off at each college to make sure we address it. Nursing's been one of those that we've had to increase salaries. We've done it in aviation, uh, thanks to some money that was provided in aviation for those instructors, but we are having to address it at each college in different areas across that college. Mr. Chairman, if I may, did, I thought you had talked about last year trying to use your foundation to try to supplement the salaries of some of these. How's that going? Yes, sir. We're just not there yet, but great question, and you're exactly right. Yes, sir. Chairman Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for that presentation. The, the work you guys do is amazing across the state and all your, all your coworkers. Um, I did have a question because you mentioned it, I think, in re reference to Southern Crescent Technical College, that there was some money in this year's budget, but there was some carryover from funds that were approved last year. I know we had a similar project possibly in Columbia County that was, uh, that was like that, that was signed and approved and signed by the governor, but yep. then no bond issued. Do those stay higher priority projects since they were through the system last year, or is everything off the table since there are no bonds? Or Chairman Newton, thank you for the question, and, and I'll differentiate between the one in Southern Crescent and the one in Augusta, as well as the one in Columbus, because yours and the one in Columbus kind of in that same situation. The one in Southern Crescent, we had received funding by this body to renovate a facility in Henry County on that campus. Unfortunately, that facility could not be renovated, so it left money uh, there that had been sold already for a bond, and so we're asking for that money to be redirected toward this project. 
the project for the advanced manufacturing facility in, in, uh, in Columbia as well as the advanced manufacturing facility in Columbus last year was approved by this body, signed by the governor, but the bond was not sold. And so we're still waiting to see if, uh, if there will be another bond sale. If that bond is sold, I'm still uh, not real clear on where that project will land. Thank you very much. And, and just one last question, if you don't mind, Chairman. Uh, the um, um, the uh, USG had a slide that uh, maybe it's a requirement federally now where you could put in your degree. It'll kind of tell you how many years, what your tuition will be, what your lost income is for that time. But it'll also tell you your one, five, and ten year I know you have a lot of programs. Right. I don't know if we've funded that yet for you to be able to offer that, but I know a CDL facility coming, the ability for somebody to put that in would, would be, are we, have we funded something where you're able we, to do that yet? We have not. We are internally looking at exactly that. Um, we all agree that we need that. And we think Welding be, and things like that that are yeah. so remunerative that, that could be great, but so yes. let us know how to help. Thank you, sir. Yes, absolutely. Chairman Hubstetler. Thank you, Commissioner Dozer. And I appreciate you knowing your numbers and presenting them yourself, and, and I know you've been a number of guys over the year. Matter of fact, in all your roles Thank over you. the years, I think in 2013 we spent a lot of time in Hayes State Prison together. We I'll did. I'll leave that story at that. But um, my, my question is the, the growth and the quick start program is great. Bartow County is getting about one out of every seven of those $74 billion, and I know the quick start's doing it. But do you guys, as an example, Georgia Highlands enrollment, is way up there right do you guys look at those areas long term for for not just quick start but for additional training education degrees a absolutely um as you look at it we've been very blessed i didn't put up the college by college comparison and the chancellor mentioned it and i did not but to give you an idea we've been very blessed to have pretty robust growth across the complete system uh, 20 of our 22 colleges in fall showed pretty pretty good growth two of them uh, one was flat and one was slightly under. And so as we look at how to grow, we take in population growth. We also take in the numbers that are coming in. And, and we also look at how it shifts. If you look, uh, it's really interesting. Chat Tech for a long time was our largest college system. The last couple of years we've seen um, Central Georgia Tech and the Macon area really have a surgence and take over that top spot and they kind of give and take. But recently we've seen Gwinnett Tech really take off this fall. And so to your point, we track that by every college and really try to map what we're offering and how we offer it to match the needs of the industry and the community, but absolutely. Representative Gamble. Thank you, Commissioner, back here on the back row. Uh, appreciate your service and all that you guys do. Um, Dr. Newcomb there at Chat Tech is great to work with. I did have a question. Several years ago, we invested, the state uh, provided funding for mobile welding labs. Um, and I was curious to know, I think there was a shared agreement between the Technical College and the Department of Corrections maybe on those units. But most importantly, do you feel like we're getting the return on investment for those units? Are they being utilized? And what success have we seen with those units to helping to provide uh, training for, for welding in that, in that particular yeah. field? Yeah, great question. I can't uh, give you the specific numbers on the return on investment, but I can tell you they are maximized. Uh, we do uh, partner with many folks. It's not a 100% uh, partnership with Corrections, but we do use a uh, mobile welding lab with Corrections quite often, but we'll use it with an industry that needs to train some of their staff on the customized recruitment side. We'll, we'll partner with DJJ some on their, their efforts to actually get skills inside of the DJJ facilities. We will go to Boy Scouts uh, of America and help them with some of their uh, badge earnings to really get the, the foot going, especially in that welding area. So they've truly been used, and we've actually used some uh, grant monies and federal dollars and local monies to actually expand that concept into manufacturing. Uh, we have one that goes around, does a lot of manufacturing using the Amitrol systems and actually teaching and learning in that area. So uh, yes, absolutely, they have been vital to our success. Leader Beverly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question regarding transportation. You know, 60% of the technical colleges uh, that are, you know, two years or less, 60% of them don't have public transportation to come within four and a half miles of the campus. 
And I'm wondering if y'all have any idea about allocating money to last mile funding so you could get buses maybe partnered with local school systems, right. uh, child care, that kind of thing. So the last mile is extremely important, especially as a kid is trying to figure out how do I walk an hour to get to class when the bus stops four and a half miles yep. away. Right, yes. Do y'all have anything afoot uh, to deal with that? Yeah, great, great question. And uh, I'm answering, and I realize it's not um, – the answer I'm giving you is not directly tied to what you just asked, but it is. Uh, we do have last mile funding. I just want to clarify that. It's not really the last mile, as you mentioned, what I'm trying to tie to. But just as the chancellor mentioned, our, complete, our entire system raises money through the foundation for last mile to help with tuition and other expenses, i.e. some of it's daycare, some of it's actually transportation. We have not looked at specifically looking at that pure last mile, as you just mentioned it, but it's something we'll definitely take into consideration. Last question is Senator Parent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for all of your great work. I've recently become aware of work that some states are doing around what they call reverse transfer. Is that something that you're familiar with or that are, we've done any looking at between USG and TCSG? Did you say reverse transfer? Reverse transfer, meaning, uh, or did you want to no, go No, no, go ahead. I, meaning I'm, if someone enrolled in a four-year university and does not manage to complete their bachelor's, they can receive a two-year degree or a credential for whatever they were able to complete, even though this, this but it would probably have to be through, for example, TCSG, yeah. if the system isn't set up at yeah. USG. So probably not in the way you're presenting. I'm going to have to educate myself on that. Um, obviously, a student who leaves USG and comes to us gets transfer credits. But I think what I'm hearing you say is somebody who maybe, maybe already earned a two-year credential yes. while they're at. I'll have to look at that. I'm not as familiar as, as I need to be to answer that. I don't think we do that, though. Okay. I'd love to talk to you further. And yeah. uh, the Chancellor, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, thanks for all y'all do. And we will be in recess. We will start back at 1 p.m. sharp to hear from the head of the Lottery Corporation. Gretchen Senators, Corbin. Senators, if you could just meet me over here at the right side of the podium left to you uh, before you walk out. Um, I'm going to blank the screen out real quick because there's actually – 